So good morning, everybody. We are going to get underway in just a moment, but we're just uh, allowing a couple of minutes for everyone to, as it were, virtually enter the room uh, because with nearly 800 people registered, that's just going to take a minute or so. So if you could bear with us, uh, I'll be back with you in just a moment. Thank you very much. Just going to give it a few seconds more because people are still uh, coming in as we speak. So a few seconds more and then I promise we will get underway. Okay, uh, let's make a start. So good morning and a very warm welcome on behalf of SEM Bureau, the European Cement Association, to this online event on Cementing Europe's Future, Building the Green Deal. My name is Jackie Davis. I have the privilege of moderating our discussions this morning. And we're going to have two entirely interactive debates after some opening keynotes to set the context for our discussions as we consider how cement and concrete together with the construction industry, can help to deliver on the European Green Deal. A couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce our host for today. Uh, in the panel, each time, as I said earlier, there will be questions from me to our panel, and then I hope also from all of you. There are two ways you can ask a question. You are all muted for now. If you want to ask your question orally, please click on the raise hands button and I will unmute you. Uh, I'm not gonna turn your camera on, so if you're watching us in your pajamas, don't worry, we won't know. Uh, but I will turn your microphone on, tell you I've done it and give you the floor. If you prefer to write your question, could you please use the Q&A button, button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat button, the Q&A button, and write your question there. And could I ask you please to make your question short and to the point so I can see at a glance who your question's for and what it is. May I suggest Twitter length or less would be ideal. Um, so, the chat button, which I asked you not to use for the Q&A, that's if you have any technical problems. You can't hear us, uh, you can't see us. Uh, we have a wizard magic team working in the background uh, and may, they might be able to help you. So go in there if you've got a technical issue and you would like some help. But as I say, please do use the Q&A button for your questions. So our Twitter hashtag today, the last thing you need to know for tweeting out to the world what you are hearing in this discussion. And please do use uh, the Twitter hashtag and get that message out far and wide. It is Cement 2050. So without further ado, it is now my great pleasure to give the floor to the president of SEM Bureau, our host today, Raoul de Parisot. Raoul, thank you for having us and over to you, sir. Thank you very much. So, dear Mr. State Secretary, <coughs> dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, on behalf of SEM Bureau, I am happy to welcome you to our conference, Cementing Europe's Future. We wished that this event could have been organized in Brussels and had given us the opportunity of personal exchanges, but COVID-19 has affected our way of working and organizing meetings. However, since last March, we have all learned to increase our virtual meeting skills, especially when it comes to fostering a debate and creating a dialogue. The focus of today's conference will be on exchanging ideas, so I will limit my introduction to a few thoughts and observations. Let me, first of all, deeply thank Mr. Flasbart, German Secretary of State for the Environment, for taking the time to address us today. I also wish to extend my thanks to all the panelists who will contribute to the success of this conference. Germany is taking up the EU presidency at an interesting, yet challenging time, while trying to strike a balance between the need to keep citizens safe and healthy 
policymakers' minds also need to turn to the economic well-being of the same citizens and offer them an outlook for a sustainable future. Our industry not only has a responsibility, but also an interest in helping the policy agenda move forward. As a local industry embedded in communities around the 200 plants spread across Europe, we want to see the 35,000 workers in cement plants and the more than 1 million workers in cement and concrete sector thrive and be proud of their contribution to the society of tomorrow. This society of tomorrow will need our end product, concrete. Its strength and durability will underpin the foundations of renewable energy infrastructure, public transport system, civil engineering and waterworks. In addition, concrete will, through its capacity to absorb and release energy, be the material of choice for greening our building stock and making it more energy efficient. The Green Deal rightly identifies the cement sector as indispensable to Europe's economy as it supplies the construction ecosystem which employs 13 million people in Europe. However, our sector's contribution does not stop at the production of cement or the putting on the market of concrete. Its role extends to benefits such as recyclability and the reabsorption potential of CO2 through the life of a build structure. It is the pride of our end product and the strong belief that it can contribute to a sustainable built environment that have motivated us to dedicate the second session today to the building blocks for a green deal for construction. And we have invited a good mix of policymakers, industry specialists and experts consultants to share, shed their light on the issue. Industry prides also goes to its innovation potential and effort, especially when it comes to reducing CO2 emission in the manufacturing of cement. In its roadmap, published in response to the Green Deal, Cement Bureau sets out the ambition of the sector to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, along with its full cement concrete value chain. The pathway to carbon neutrality passes by a combination of increasing business practices such as the use of alternative fuels and raw materials and a strong focus on research, innovation and development on a variety of carbon capture technology, low carbon cements and a further reduction of the clinker to cement ratio. The decarbonization efforts will present a challenge for our industry, not only from a technological perspective, but also from a financial perspective. The success of our efforts will depend on our determination and focus, but equally on having the right regulatory and financial levers in place to drive through the required changes. A viable business case requires a reasonable return on investment, which is not only assessed on financial grounds, but equally depends on the regulatory conditions that can make or break such investment. It also requires the buying of our workforce that needs the necessary skills and motivation to walk the path with us. It is this mix of technology, financial feasibility, workers buy-in and regulatory facilitation that will be the topic for the first session during which we also bring together experts from across these different areas. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Secretary of State Flasbar for his introductory words. Thanks, thanks a lot, um, Mr. De Parizon. Um, can you hear me? I hope so. Beautifully, thank you very much, sir. Okay, so thanks for inviting me uh, to your conference. Um, and of course, I think as everyone, uh, I would have loved to be in Brussels uh, as it was intended, but now due to COVID, we have to do it. You are doing it virtually, and it's a pleasure to be with you in this format. Um, cementing Europe's future, building the Green Deal is the title uh, of your conference. And uh, reading this title and, and the concept note, uh, it comes for me a bit like a dream. 
uh, is this industry really heading for decarbonization by 2015? Obviously something happened or maybe two things happened I want to mention. Number one is uh, the game changer, which was the Paris Agreement back in 2015, which led finally to the European Green Deal. Uh, and I will come uh, back to this uh, in a minute. The second one is, um, of course, the COVID crisis. Uh, I heard, I think, as all of you, many times that this crisis has shown us how vulnerable our societies are um, how fragile um, our interconnected um, uh, economies in the world are. This is all true, but I don't want to follow up on this thought. Um, the real, maybe sort of miracle for me is the reaction how to get out of the crisis. Honestly, um, I haven't been so sure whether the Green Deal in Europe would survive uh, March of this year. Uh, it was very easy to imagine that we would see a kind of a rollback into old pattern when it comes to recovery of our economies. But the opposite happened. In the middle of the dramatic increase of COVID numbers in uh, spring, uh, I got a phone call from industry, uh, not the cement industry, a sister industry, a steel company, uh, and I expected some uh, kind of uh, request that we should slow down a bit our climate ambition, uh, maybe some adjustment at the emission trading uh, scheme or something like that. The opposite was the case. The message was we in the steel industry understood we have to decarbonize. Uh, we are going along our way and please government hold course. Don't uh, go back into old patterns because then we are completely confused. We don't, do need a clear signal that uh, what government said in the past is still true. So back to the game changer of the Paris uh, Agreement. Maybe, and I sometimes hear it, it's not a perfect agreement. Yes, it might be. Um, yes, and it is unfortunately that with the US, one big uh, party decided uh, to leave. Uh, but we all will hear, I'm very sure, the words from their colleagues, we are back. Uh, maybe uh, soon after the first days of November, but certainly uh, in the near future, uh, they will come back because it is not a competition advantage uh, to go uh, on old brown tracks in the future. But the Paris Agreement, and that is what I mean with game changer, is the first global legal framework fighting uh, against climate change uh, and to head for greenhouse gas neutrality in the center um, in the middle of the century. Discussing with the industry prior um, to uh, the Paris Agreement uh, usually uh, went along the following patterns. I heard uh, very often, yes, we are committed to climate change policy. Yes, we know that climate targets are important, but, uh, and after the but, uh, something uh, wrong appeared. Um, and this changed completely. Uh, my discussions with industry are of a completely different uh, spirit. Uh, the, uh, the attempt uh, to relativate uh, the climate targets disappeared. Now more and more industries are committed and in a credible way committed to fully decarbonize. The toxicity of an 80 to 95 percent reduction target, and I mentioned it in the past very, very often, was that everybody uh, had the illusion um, to have access to the remaining 20 or 5 percent. Uh, and of course it was an illusion because everybody wanted to sit there. Now, um, how to get from the commitment uh, here, not only from your industry, also from others to reality. Actually, uh, the recovery money, uh, both on the national as well as on the um, next generation EU uh, wide level helps to get into a concrete implementation of the decarbonization strategy. And this means collaboration uh, between industry and governments. 
And the uh, Paris Agreement provides a level playing field in the long run. This level playing field doesn't exist always yet. Uh, the carbon leakage provisions are therefore essential in the existing EU legislation and it will remain, uh, remain a building block for the future uh, EU climate policy and uh, Germany is keen uh, to support uh, everything to ensure that climate ambition does not go along with uh, competitive disadvantages. Uh, but also support schemes uh, for springboard innovation are essential. Luckily, in Germany, we did not start uh, from zero when the COVID crisis uh, appeared um, and when it uh, came to designing um, the recovery schemes. We also uh, designed already in the past the sp the support programs for our carbon intensive uh, industry. Uh, we started uh, some years ago with discussions um, with the energy and process emission in uh, intensive industry, and especially uh, with the cement industry. I want to thank at this occasion uh, Christian Knell and uh, Martin Schneider from the Verein Deutscher Zementwerke for the intensive, uh, and I, I need to say, very open and very credible, honest discussions. And this um, is relevant, of course, because the uh, cement industry is one of the high emitters uh, in the world. 8% uh, of the global uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, are uh, related uh, to the global cement industry. And as we are seeing uh, in uh, China and other regions of the world, uh, that uh, building houses uh, and installations uh, is going on for a while uh, and uh, will increase even. Uh, for example, in uh, China, the whole building uh, stock of Germany is built every two years. Um, it is very obvious to reach global greenhouse gas neutrality that cement industry has to go along the um, uh, pathway to decarbonize and to reach this greenhouse gas um, neutrality for um, their own industry. So what was the outcome um, of our um, talks in the past? First, we developed an industrial um, decarbonization funding program aiming at energy and emission intensive uh, industries. Uh, for example, the cement industry, steel industry, uh, chemical industry and uh, some others. with a clear focus um, on uh, avoiding uh, technologies. We started um, actually with very little money uh, some two, three years ago. Soon after, we were able uh, to organize an increase of the budget to a billion uh, volume. With this, luckily, uh, we had an instrument already in place to add now uh, the additional uh, recovery money. Second, we estab established a uh, competent center on uh, climate change mitigation in energy intensive industry, our so-called KAI, uh, K -A -I, um, in Cottbus, south of uh, Berlin, actually uh, right in the, the uh, lignite region, uh, which is affected by the phase out uh, decisions uh, of coal uh, we just took in uh, Germany. Uh, the CHI will operate as a sort of center of uh, excellence, organizing the uh, interface between uh, policy, uh, science, uh, and industry. Thirdly, um, we are supporting investment costs uh, in, uh, um, uh, in this industry. This is essential, but it is not sufficient. Uh, as long as we do not have a level playing field also on the operational cost side, uh, there is still a gap. And therefore, we will use the money of our national, or some parts of the money of our national hydrogen uh, strategy, strategy to support exactly this difference uh, in operational uh, costs with other uh, regions and uh, countries of the world. My ministry will start a pilot program for carbon contracts for difference. Uh, this is a pilot program to learn about more about this instrument. It is discussed uh, lengthy in the past, but uh, there are very few examples in practice. So we need to learn more about uh, how this instrument will work uh, to establish uh, a, a general support scheme uh, out of this. Coming to the end, uh, um, I wanna mention a few words uh, on the policy framework we are developing currently uh, in the EU to underpin uh, the Green Deal. 
as you know, Germany uh, is um, uh, at the moment in the EU presidency until the end of the year. Um, our, um, we are aiming uh, to get an agreement on uh, the proposal of the climate law proposed by the EU Commission uh, by the end of the year, including the new NDC, the National Determined um, uh, Contribution, uh, or in a nutshell, our climate target. You all are aware that the Commission proposed at least 55% greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions uh, by 2030, whereas we have at the moment the target of uh, 40%. Um, we um, still have to go quite a way. Uh, the views inside the European Union between member states uh, are still divergent, uh, but our ambition is to reach an uh, agreement. And as the Chancellor Merkel said, we as Germany support the proposal uh, of the European uh, Commission. Um, this will be followed uh, next semester under the, the Portuguese uh, presidency uh, with underpinning uh, this new target with uh, instruments. The Commission proposed or set out already um, uh, a number of proposals, options, uh, kind of a menu, uh, which can be used to reach this target. Uh, it is quite sure that uh, a reform of the existing ETS will be part um, of the instruments uh, and uh, that this ETS has to be adjusted to the new target of at least 55%, uh, uh, assume that it will be this target, um, which means uh, that we also have to adjust, of course, our carbon, carbon leakage uh, pro uh, provisions by that, or, that I mentioned um, just a few minutes before. Um, I'm quite sure uh, that the proposal um, of the Commission uh, will be uh, in principle agreed to have a second um, um, pricing system for those sectors that are not included in the ETS at the moment. Uh, there are also on this uh, subject different options uh, to completely merge uh, the sectors uh, in a unique uh, uh, ETS system. We have some uh, doubts. Uh, on such an approach as it would um, push all the um, mitigation burden to the industry. So uh, we would advocate for um, a kind of a firewall for at least um, maybe the next decade uh, between those sectors coming in and the existing ETS uh, sectors. Um, we uh, saw proposals by the Commission to increase the renewable energy target for uh, Europe and for the European member states, as well as a, a new target for uh, energy efficiency. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks again for inviting me uh, to this uh, conference. I'm really delighted that you are uh, using this uh, virtual format uh, to shape the way for decarbonization of your uh, industry. I wish you, uh, although a virtual, but still a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, State Secretary. And if I could keep you with me for a moment, I'd just like to ask you uh, a couple of questions. So underlining there very much, perhaps you're surprised, as you say, that the Green Deal hasn't been derailed by COVID-19, um, outlining where you think we need to go and some of the policy framework that is needed to support it. And, and something I would like to come back to in our discussion today, repeatedly underlining the importance of that level playing field, which, as you said, does not yet exist. But I wanted to pick up on something you talked about um, quite briefly, which was the collaboration between industry and government. Um, how well do you think that collaboration is working now? Uh, is there more that could be done? Is there more you would like uh, from industry uh, to work with you on addressing these issues? Yes, as I said, I, I think a lot has changed, at, at least in my country and in my experience. Um, uh, we have luckily built a lot of trust in uh, discussions between industry uh, and, and government. And I think, uh, I suppose, in the, in the past, um, it was unlikely that managers from uh, industry um, got to bed uh, with uh, nice dreams about the Ministry of Environment. There was a lot of mistrust and vice versa. Uh, and uh, discussing in detail what the decarbonization pathways could be. Uh, and with a commitment, I uh, said out many times that I understood 
we as a Ministry of Environment understood that if you want to um, organize uh, um, springboard innovation, uh, the industry has to get also support by the government. This is not coming from markets itself because uh, the markets are in a way, as we all know, cruel. And as long as we have such huge cost differences, this will not uh, allow for such a pathway without um, getting in a way protected, in a reasonable way, uh, protected and supported. Yes, uh, and we'll discuss what support uh, this particular industry needs uh, to deliver on those goals. Can I perhaps also take one that's already come in from the audience and it's about carbon capture. Do you think European governments are in favour and, and what about the general public? Um, what is what is the view in Germany? What approach are you taking and, and how do you see this discussion across Europe now? Because it's been talked about for a long time, but is the commitment really there? Um, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's different in different countries in, in Europe. Uh, and um, talking about my country, uh, this has been uh, in the past a toxic debate. Uh, we have made uh, legal provisions uh, that uh, carbon capture and storage is not allowed at the moment uh, in Germany. Uh, we can do it for research purposes, but not um, for industrial um, um, purposes. Uh, I, I think uh, that we can get out of uh, this lock-in uh, situation. Uh, I was always of the view um, that uh, we might need uh, CCS at the end for exactly those um, emissions that we cannot avoid finally. Um, so it is uh, this kind of process emissions. Um, looking back in the past, I think it was in Germany very much linked uh, to the question of use of coal and as long as um, CCS was discussed to use it for, um, well, to survive um, or to, to allow our lignite industry to survive. Uh, it uh, met a lot of opposition. But there is a rationale to use CCS for uh, process emission of industry, but only, only if uh, we do credibly, both on the side of industry as well as on the side of uh, governments, everything to avoid emissions. And only if we can prove credibly that uh, we have done everything to avoid the emissions, then I think we can have acceptance in society also to use CCS. Thank you very much. We are out of time there. So I would just like to thank you very much, State Secretary, uh, for such an inspiring start to our discussions today. We are very grateful to you uh, for finding the time and we wish you well with those objectives. Uh, you've still got quite a lot of work to do in this area before the end of the year. Uh, so we wish you well in the presidency in doing that. Thank you so much for joining us. We will discuss all the issues you've raised and report back to you later on. Uh, great to have you with us, sir. Thank you. Thank so, you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're going to discuss those issues, ladies and gentlemen, through two panels today. The first, we're going to focus on the road to 2050. Is it a dream? Uh, the State Secretary said, decarbonizing our industry. We're going to hear about what's being done by the industry, what more could be done, and going back to what the State Secretary is talking about, how governments can best support the sector to meet those targets. And then after a short break, uh, we're going to talk about the sustainable built environment, a green deal for construction. Uh, so lots to discuss. Um, in each case, uh, before I introduce the panel, I'd like to get a little snapshot of some of your views. So uh, we're going to have a couple of polling questions. You don't need to open an app or do anything. They'll just appear on the screen and you vote. So as we start our discussion in the first panel on the road to 2050 decarbonizing our industry, let's have a look at that first question. So what, in your view, is the most important route to cutting emissions for cement? Is it, we're just talking about carbon capture use and storage, is it deploying CCUS? Is it replacing fossil fuels with non-recyclable waste and biomass waste? Or is it bringing low carbon cement to the market? You may have other issues uh, that you would like to see as options there, but among those options, which for you is the most important? So CCUS, non-recyclable waste and biomass or bringing low carbon cements to the market and that will raise the question we'll discuss later uh, about incentives what incentives might be needed to do it uh, and in the case of the first two what can policymakers really do to ensure that replacement can happen 
uh, and can work. So I see lots of you voting there, which is terrific. Uh, let us, just gonna give it another second or two because the votes are coming in thick and fast. Um, and we have so many of you signed on. Um, so last chance, CCUS, non-recyclable waste and biomass waste, or bringing low carbon cements to the market. Okay, let us close the voting on that first question. And for you, um, okay, it's fairly evenly divided. 36% of you uh, saying the most important thing is CCUS, but more of you talking about low cements, uh, carbon cements to the market. 41% there, and non-recyclable waste uh, and biomass waste uh, 23%, so a quarter of you. So fairly evenly divided, but with that question of bringing the product to market, the most crucial. So let's now have a look at our second question in this session. If we could have that second question. How can the EU best support low carbon innovation in the cement sector? Is it for you, is it about the money? providing more funding and incentivizing national funding? Is it about the policy environment, adopting enabling environments? Is it, to go back to that issue the State Secretary repeatedly referred to, ensuring a level playing field? Or is it a bit of all the above? So is it funding, policies, linked to that level playing field, or all of the above? And I realize all the of the above is the very tempting answer here, um, but it would be interesting to know what your priority within all of the above is. Uh, so if I can draw you into picking one of them, I will take it as red, because I see we have two thirds of you saying all of the above. I'll take it as red that you, you all think we need to do all of these things. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, as I say, with the other one. So is it money, enabling policies, or, focus on that level paying field on carbon and regulatory certainty, which of course is linked to the enabling policies, but is a specific part of it. So lots of votes still coming in. So I will give it another couple of seconds uh, and we will see where we get to. Um, yeah, it's slowing down now. So let's have a look. So let's end the polling there and let's have a look at those results. So 59% of you saying all of the above. But when it comes to choosing between the other issues, uh, level playing field, you're putting the same emphasis on it the State Secretary did, 23% of you, 12%, it's about the enabling policies. And very interestingly, because in many debates, people always say, we need more money, we need more financing from the EU. Here, only 6% of you saying EU national funding is the most important thing. But as I say, I'm taking as read there that 59% of you who said a combination of all uh, the above uh, is probably uh, the majority answer. There is no one silver bullet. Uh, so lots to discuss with our panel. Uh, so at this point, let me introduce them and let's, uh, that's it, take those results of the voting away if we could. So, Joining me now to discuss this, I am delighted to welcome Artur Runga Metzger, Director for Climate Strategy, Governance and Emissions in the Directorate General for Climate Action at the European Commission. A very good morning to you, sir. Uh, Maria de Graza Carvalho, MEP, uh, Member of the European Parliament's Industry, Research and Energy Committee. Judith Girton Darling, who is Deputy Director General of Industrial, the global trade union uh, representing more than 50 million people in over 140 countries. Mechthild Vosdorfer, Director for Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the International Energy Agency. And John Morris, CEO, Western and Southern Europe at Heidelberg Cement. So a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, very good to see you. Um, and great to have you all with us. Uh, so uh, let's start our discussion. And as I mentioned earlier, I want to just dive straight into this dis debate. Um, so I want to just ask you all a very straightforward question. We have heard, and the European Green Deal, as Raoul said at the beginning, explicitly recognizes the cement industry as essential to the EU economy. My question is more specific, and Artur, perhaps I could start with you. How do you see its role in contributing to CO2 emission reduction and carbon neutrality? It set out this roadmap to doing it. Uh, it says it's on that path already. How important will it be if we are to meet our objectives for 2050? 
Um, Jackie, good morning and uh, good morning to everybody on the panel. Um, I think that the cement industry is going to play a central role uh, in getting to climate neutrality in 2050. So the next 30 years uh, to make this transition and transformation uh, will be very important. Uh, and it is, I think, the various aspects that have already been raised. So on one hand, of course, it is the emissions that come from the sector itself by producing cement uh, that we need to get down. And I think here, innovation will have to play a major role uh, in the coming years to make sure one pushes them down as much as possible. Um, and that also will have to do with creating um, the right policy framework. And I think we will discuss that later on. But then the second issue is, um, and you will see that also in the announcements that will come out this week, is that the cement sector, of course, sits within the entire economy. Mm -hmm. And where it is going to be very important is when it comes to all the infrastructure that we need to build in the coming decades that will have to be climate proof. And when it comes to renovating our houses. So the renovation wave that is going to be published uh, during the course of this week um, there the cement sector is going to play an, uh, an eminent role because cement can help in the construction sector to reduce emissions, to insulate houses, to make them better than what they were before. So I think there's in various ways cement sector is going to be crucial uh, to the 2050 uh, transformation. Thank you very much. And I'd like to talk, as you say, about what that right policy framework looks like. And we'll come specifically back to the question of a sustainable built environment, the renovation wave initiative and the many other uh, actions the EU is taking in this area a little bit later. But Maria de Gracio Cavallo, from a parliamentary perspective, from your perspective, how important do you believe this sector is uh, for achieving the 2050 target? Can you put your mic on, please? You're muted, Maria. You have to unmute yourself. I can't magically do it. Okay. Thank okay. Thank you. Good morning, Jackie. Good morning to all the members of the panel and thanks for the invitation. Um, as it was uh, already said, uh, cement industry is um, uh, crucial for the European economy and is one of the sectors that uh, still pose uh, several challenge to the decarbonization. Uh, technological challenge, application challenge. Um, so we need to, to pay uh, a lot of attention to, to the sector, both from the engineers and the technology point of view, and also the, the policy make, uh, makers. Um, I think that one of the most important uh, uh, issues that uh, uh, for this sector uh, is to, uh, to have this uh, long life uh, of the product approach, uh, so from cradle to grave, because it, it, is, it is one of the uh, sectors that uh, would uh, benefit more from this. Uh, we should have this approach to everything, but in the case of uh, uh, cement, because the concrete will absorb CO2, the, the sector has a lot to gain if we have th this approach. And we know that uh, uh, in general, um, in Europe, but probably all over the world, we have, uh, it's much easier to have a more vertical approach to, to everything, you no know, max more sectorial approach. And when you need to, to look at horizontal and to consider that both from the technical engineer point of view, but also from the policy making point of view, uh, that is, is a big challenge because we really need to have a, a, a very holistic view of all the policies and the, to, to consider from the, the clinker production to the different uh, phases of production until the end to the construction and then until the end of the life cycle of the products. And this is going to be a, 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 big, a big challenge also for the policy maker, but it's makers, but it's something that we need uh, to do because uh, of the, the European economy, because of the jobs. And as uh, um, Arthur just said, the, the renovation wave uh, is, is for us in the parliament in, and for my political group, a very important priority. Uh, we want to, 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 to give this the, the highest uh, 
priority because it's something that used local products, gives a, a lot of, of, of jobs, creates a lot of jobs, okay. and, and also has um, secondary benefits that are very, very important. Uh, the, the comfort of people, uh, getting cities and village much pleasant. So uh, it, it has very positive effects. So we, we really bet on the renovation and for that we need a clean, sustainable salmon sector. Let's come back uh, to all those issues, Maria, in our discussion. And indeed, you're talking there about this life cycle approach and, and very striking the degree uh, to which uh, SEM Bureau's own carbon neutrality roadmap talks about what it calls a five C's approach, all the way through clinker, cement, concrete, construction, and then recarbonation. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about that uh, from John in a little while. But Judith, if I could turn to you first, in terms of the importance of this sector, that's been underlined by everybody, not just for the economy generally, but also for delivering on sustainability targets, on circular economy targets. How do you see uh, its role and its potential to achieve its own targets and contribute to that wider goal? Thanks very much, Jackie, and um, also welcome to everybody else. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be here today. I should just clarify that I'm the Deputy General Secretary for Industrial Europe, so only representing okay. workers across Europe and not the whole world. Um, that's a that's a definitely a bigger job, but um, that brings me straight to our key point. Um, I think we have basically a political decision which has to be made. We we know that uh, from everything that we've heard so far this morning, there will be a lot of cement um, needed and used in the future in Europe. And the question is whether we are creating a policy framework and a regulatory framework which ensures that that cement can be made in Europe or whether we fall back on imports. And for European workers, um, obviously we opt for the first option. Uh, the workers in the European cement industry see themselves as a fundamental part of delivering um, that green deal. Um, but we know that as a very carbon intensive process industry, uh, there needs to be a massive technological shift. And some of those uh, technological shifts will come from inside the cement industry. But actually, if you look at uh, the overall framework, much has to be uh, developed in terms of broader infrastructure and the broader policy framework um, in countries and across the whole of the content, mm -hmm. uh, whole of the continent. Um, so there is a technological transition up till, that, up till now. That has been uh, the main focus of what's been talked about um, in this discussion. For us, there is a social transition which is going on at the same time. Um, that social transition um, uh, we want to see as a just transition. Um, and a just transition for Europe cement workers, as for all of European energy intensive sector workers, um, has a number of elements. It has that strong, stable industrial policy framework, um, ensuring regional clustering of industries, um, industries like cement, where it's much better to work together with other energy intensive industries to build the infrastructure necessary. Um, research and development, and there we have big concerns about the current budget proposals, even if in the poll it was the lowest. Um, I want to dropping. come back on the specifics of what we. That's need. right. That's right. But the just here, the just right. trans the just transition framework is really vital in terms of involvement of the workforce, and that was something that the states minister uh, raised about public support, and also was raised um, in the introduction. So there's a workforce involvement, but there's also a broader social transition. Let's come back to that. Dealing with uh, energy poverty and Emissions. I want to stop you there just for a moment because I'm just trying at the moment to set out the scale of the challenge, what we need to do, and then we'll delve into some of that detail. And you're raising a lot of fascinating topics I really do want to come back to in our discussion. But Meg Tilt, if I could bring you in at this point, uh, and in terms of we've, we've talked about the role of the industry, uh, both in the economy and the Green Deal. So I think it probably doesn't need repeating in that sense. But um, its potential to really contribute now and, and what you see as the important challenges, the most important challenges, if it is to play that role. So good morning from Paris and thank you very much uh, for inviting me and I greet also the other panelists. I'm very happy to join it from the International Energy Agency. So I very much welcome the debate, first of all, because the cement industry 
has a key responsibility to reduce emissions over the coming decades. And that is shown in the 2050 roadmap from the industry, the European Green Deal, and so on. We know that in 2019, around 7% of global en energy sector emissions came from the cement industry. One quarter of all industrial emissions globally are from cement. So among the industries, energy intensives, cement together with steel and some others play an absolutely key role. And as we all know in that are the process emissions. And in the case of, of cement industry, these are two thirds of the emissions. So from the start, it's key that cement industry is part and needs to be the part of the reduction of emissions because they are a big contributor. How to do it and what can the industry do it together with government? I think we come back to a few points, but let me highlight three things. First of all, material efficiency. We heard a little bit about it. So uh, how, how to use more efficiently cement and clinker, for example, uh, in, in, in the production. The next one, which is absolutely key as well, energy efficiency. So uh, how can we reduce the emissions uh, um, and the energy used uh, to produce it? So these two, I would say, are relatively low hanging fruits and industry has already done in that direction quite a bit, but needs to uh, accelerate. But in the longer run, and that was one of your polling question, I think we need new technology innovation. And one of them to reduce emissions from existing plants is carbon capture, utilization and storage. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of demonstration projects around the world, including Europe, including Germany on the research side. So CCS for us is one of the key technology to reduce emissions also in the cement industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for picking up on those polling questions because I would like to feed them into our discussion. But John, I deliberately left you till last because I wanted first to get the impression of others, of your stakeholders, of those with whom you need to collaborate. We've already talked about partnership and collaboration. Get their views of your sector and its role before I turn to you. And if I could just ask you really two questions. Firstly, in terms of what the industry has done, you know, where are we now? Because we're talking about the potential for the future, but this, has, this is an industry that's playing already a key part in the circular economy. So where are we now in terms of innovation? I know your company has a, uh, a sustainability strategy and you've set very clear targets. So where are we now? How much has been done and how much more potential is there? And then we'll come back to this issue of what you need to realize that potential and the challenges ahead. But where are we now and what's the potential? Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit relieved having heard my panelists. I didn't know what they were going to say this morning because I'm the only producer on the panel and, and proud to be here. Um, to specifically address your question, um, we've come a long way already from 1990 to uh, last year, uh, over 20% reduction in emissions. Um, and a lot of technological change over that period, but we know full well we've got a lot more to do. Um, and just building on the point that was just made from Methchill, you know, I think the overall point I would make from the producers, um, uh, and, and that's who I'm representing today, is that we really do take our responsibility seriously. Yeah. Um, I think over the last 18 months in particular, you know, I've been really pleased to see all of the uh, cement associations and all of the 25 to 30 companies um, around uh, Europe really come together behind the, um, the carbon neutral path and the roadmap to 2050. Um, we know what we've got to do. We take our, um, our responsibilities seriously um, and we're working hard to get there. So I think all, the first point I would make is we've come a long way, that's shown in the figures. The second is all cement makers are behind this push for carbon neutrality by 2050. Some of us um, are going further and faster uh, because we really want to make a difference in the next 10 years, accelerated by 30% reduction by 2025, 20, uh, uh, continuing to less than 500 kilos per ton cement by 2030, and global carbon neutral by 2050, not just European uh, carbon neutral. So 
the message is we really want to get there. We've got the technical ability. We've got the engineers. Um, I hope you can hear from me, and I'm representative of, of a number of people that we've got the will and the drive to get there. We really need the policy framework. We really need help in adjusting the supply chains and, and creating the correct incentives to help us get us there. Um, and, and that's what uh, we're really driving. We can do the technical side and we've got the will, but we need the policy. So for you, and, and I asked um, the audience, you know, where, where the challenges were and where you needed the support. Uh, for you, this question of, of incentives, um, which links, you know, 41% of our audience talking about, um, you know, the take up of low carbon uh, products in this area. Um, what is the biggest challenge for you in this area? Where do you need the most help? Um, I think when, if, we, if we're jumping to policy, I think we need stability. I think we need first and foremost a, a framework where we've got uh, consistency and stability and we stop carbon leakage. Um, and, and so the, the implementation of a border adjustment mechanism alongside the phase four of the EU ETS is essential because we, as, as in, in the opening uh, sequence, we've got 200 cement plants around Europe, 35,000 people employed, uh, down the construction chain, 13 million in construction across Europe. Um, we've got the consistency of the EU ETS moving into phase four, so we sort of know where carbon pricing is going, except what that does to us is significantly disadvantage those 200 cement plants compared with the cement plants outside Europe. Uh, and therefore, without a border adjustment mechanism, we're just going to export the problem um, and make uh, the, the, the overall CO2 output higher because we'll just import the material back into Europe, which is an absolute own goal. So for you, that's the absolutely central issue. Got to tackle that. The rest we can come back to in discussion. But Arta, a reaction uh, to what you're hearing, because you talked about we need the right policy framework. That's been echoed uh, by everybody, really, in their opening uh, remarks. And this emphasis uh, put by Judith on so that this the cement that we have all agreed will be so important to the economy can be made in Europe. And John, immediately when I asked him what's the challenge, immediately going uh, to this question of the uh, border adjustment mechanism. For you, do you see that as the biggest challenge ahead? Um, kind of, if you look in the medium term, yes, that's going to be uh, one of the biggest challenges ahead. Uh, and I think John is absolutely right that um, if carbon prices go up to a certain level, then uh, it's very likely if you don't have similar regulatory frameworks in place in the countries around Europe, um, then you will see um, kind of cement being imported into Europe. Uh, and of course, it's going to be produced under the conditions um, or the regulatory framework that is existing there. I think today already uh, we see an increase in imports from some of the neighboring countries like Turkey so I think this is something we need to take into consideration and it is part of the Green Deal. So that's the good news. A carbon border adjustment mechanism is something we are working on at the present point in time. Uh, we see it as an essential element of uh, what I would call the June 21 package, uh, where we want to um, tighten uh, European legislation to get to the minus 55% by the year 2030. Um, so I think uh, cement industry is, of course, particularly uh, vulnerable to that um, because of the huge uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, that come alongside with the uh, process um, of uh, um, producing cement. Thank you very much. Maria, just on, well, let's stay with this issue for a moment uh, about the carbon border mechanism. Uh, for you, um, how do we make sure that this really does work? Uh, and the link between this and we talked already uh, about the ETS and the future of the ETS. Um, we have already uh, a position or uh, in our group and uh, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, we have some conditions for, for, for that to, to be a reality. Uh, so the, the first we expect a, a, a thorough impact assessment as usually is the case from the European Commission 
Um, uh, we also uh, uh, say that uh, this has to coexist with the ETS. We cannot replace the ETS and the free allowance continue to be uh, distributed. If it's WTO uh, compatible and uh, if other options for rebalancing the CO2 in the products prove to be less effective measures than this one. Uh, so, as you understand, we have quite a cautious uh, um, attitude towards this mechanism as we uh, consider that uh, uh, to export in general for Europe is essential, it's crucial, and uh, we have to avoid situations that uh, not well, so well designed uh, mechanism could jeopardize the, the in general, the um, Ex exports uh, in other products and we are uh, one of the biggest exporter in the world and we need to continue to be so. Mm. Uh, Megdil, did you want to comment on, on this issue before we move on? Yeah, thank you, but I, I can basically agree to the previous uh, speakers because we can see the carbon border adjustment as one element. It can be one contribution. Ideally, we would have a world where there is one global carbon price but uh, in the medium term where there is none or not, there are some obviously other regions in China uh, uh, working on it, uh, introducing an ETS. But as long as we are not there, it could be one key element uh, for the industry uh, under the a bit of cautious. It's also quite complex. So we shouldn't mm -hmm. think that this is per se a solution which we can bring in tomorrow. So, I mean, it has to be well through and it's part of the commission yeah. proposal. That we just add one figure of the cement production globally. For the time being, 2019, 55% of the cement production comes from China, 4% from the EU, and then some other parts. So I think there is some um, reflection here on how to protect or what should it be uh, the European industry and the European mm -hmm. employers when there is a, a big competition uh, and a worldwide production, which is half in China right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Judith, did you want to react to that? Um, well, not, not particularly to that, but um, to the question of carbon border. Yeah. Um, as um, industrial, uh, I would say that we have a, a very similar uh, position to some of the concerns which have been raised. We're very supportive of the principle of a, um, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, but the devil will be in the detail. But what I did want to highlight is a concern at the moment that for us, a carbon border adjustment mechanism is about a level playing field related to envi the environment and climate. And we are seeing um, the whole discussion about uh, the development of the mechanism being linked to the repayment of the debt linked to the recovery plan. And I think it's really essential that we don't start to confuse what instruments are for, because this shouldn't be an instrument which is about filling the black hole created by COVID and the economic impact of COVID and repaying uh, the debt, uh, which, you know, the investment we need, the recovery plan we are very supportive of, we need, but let's be careful that we don't then try and utilize instruments which are foreseen for something else to um, meet the challenges of the future in terms of repaying that debt. Thank you very much. John, could I come back to something Raoul talked about in his opening remarks? He talked about we need viable business cases. Uh, and there's a question already coming in from someone about how can the circular economy and a more efficient use of cement uh, become a business case for the industry? For you, uh, when we look at the question of, of, of business models uh, and that link to the circular economy, what for you is most important uh, to enable uh, you to, to make that business case for the big investments that are going to be needed for you to live up to that responsibility that if you said you take very seriously? What, make, what will make it viable and what does that then mean for policy? And then we can discuss that with the panel. Yeah, okay. Um... I mean, for us in, in, in business and in our company, you know, the first and foremost thing is we need a consistent, stable framework. I think as the oldest emissions trading scheme, uh, the EU ETS is actually going down that way. It does provide us with a degree of stability, but that's the reason we talk about border adjustment mechanism, because that stability is only there with uh, a border adjustment mechanism because as Methchill just said, in the absence of a global carbon price, 
this is the pragmatic, realistic alternative in the medium term. So if we have that, so the first and foremost is, is, a, uh, is stability. So if I can look at an investment over the next 15, 20 years and understand um, or make some judgments on where carbon pricing is going to go because we have the, the, um, yeah, the, the phase four of the ETS and we know that there's a border adjustment mechanism going to be in place, then that's the first thing. Because without the border adjustment mechanism, you can't build a business case. You may as well build a new cement plant in Turkey. Yeah. And bring it. Um, and then there are um, policy assistance uh, that, that we can that, that we'd like to see in the shorter term. Some of which is very easy. We've met, we've come a long way in the last twenty years on the back of the um, EU waste directive, for example, that I think was put in place twenty eight years ago. Um, it, we have some plants that are in 90 plus percent alternative fuel levels now. We really have got the ability and the, and the technicians to make this happen. But we've still got some countries, Italy is a good example, where uh, they're exporting their waste. We burn in Germany Italian waste and we can't get the waste permits in Italy. This is crazy. So there are certain um, policy uh, requests and pushes like that one, and in the short term, pushing governments to change the, uh, uh, to be progressive in their uh, standards and in their norms, so that they're adopting low carbon cements that we want to sell. We want to sell low carbon cements that have got lower clinker factors, that have got lower CO2 footprints. But actually, when we work with governments, they're very, very cautious about adopting. Uh, the the uh, the norms and the building standards to allow that to happen. So, some very relatively simple things. And then the bigger picture for uh, for policy involves uh, assistance in early stage technologies. We're really working hard to capture carbon, but those are early stage technologies. So the the use of such things as the Horizon Fund and the Innovation Fund to to uh, get those projects really moving is important. And the implementation and the, the help on the infrastructure pipelines for yeah. carbon so that we can move it to where to ideally where we can use it again or if not where we can store up store it i i totally pick up the point that was made earlier that uh, from uh, mr flashbach that that we do not in the industry see carbon capture use and storage as the way the only way forward it has to be uh, what we do if we can't reduce it and if we can't use it, indeed. we have to store it. Indeed, but one third of our audience thought it was a very important part. It came only uh, just behind that question of the take up of low carbon bodies. But Arthur, um, John there outlining the key areas where he believes action is needed. And if you look at the SEM Bureau uh, roadmap, more detail put on, on many of those issues. But uh, for you, are they the challenges as you see them as a policymaker, the things you need to focus your attention on? Are there other things you would highlight? What, what's most important, do you think, to create this enabling environment? Um, I, I think this goes exactly into the right direction um, because um, kind of the carbon price itself, of course, is not going to change what's happening in the industry. What's going to change the industry is innovation and new technologies. Um, and um, of course, we can wait until the carbon price is high enough in order to drive that technology. Uh, but I think that would be a disservice to our society. And I think Judith has been mentioning that very clearly. Uh, we don't want to make cement enormously expensive because of the high CO2 emissions. So we need to drive down the cost of innovation. Uh, and the, we need to have a very close look at um, where do, do these emissions come from? Uh, and John was mentioning uh, kind of the waste burning that is happening. Um, and waste is certainly an area in our policy framework uh, that we have not been looking very closely at uh, over the last years, but we will have to much more closely because where is the waste coming from? That is the big question. If that is waste coming from fossil fuel resources, then by burning more waste, we are not going to help the climate. Um, so I think this is something uh, that we will have to revert to uh, on the waste side and it's something we have been mentioning 
in our strategy that on the waste side something needs to happen. Uh, then in terms of the um, utilization of carbon, yes, of course, that is something uh, that is very important for us and that is where we will invest in innovation uh, with our Horizon Europe and also with the Innovation Fund, uh, where the first call is going to close um, in a little more than a week's time. And we will spend a billion. I hope that kind of we have been talking with the cement industry a lot over the last um, months and years, uh, that there will be many proposals coming forward um, to see um, that we can test many of these technologies really at scale. Because I think that is what is needed uh, in the coming 10 years. Uh, we have been doing a lot of pilot things, small and tiny, and they look very nice, but now it needs to get to industrial scale. And then thirdly, um, and, and I think that's also, of course, linked to infrastructure. And you have seen how uh, the Commission has been opening uh, the trans-European networks also for CO2 infrastructure. Um, but it is an interesting point, particular for the cement industry, because usually the cement industry is where the raw material is. Uh, that is not necessary where the other big industrial clusters are who might need the CO2. So I think that that is a delicate question uh, also when it comes to investment in the industry uh, in the future. Where are you going to put your factories uh, in future? Uh, should it not be closer to where you find the customers for the CO2 when you talk about CCUS? And finally, I think that um, without CCS, um, I think I haven't seen any um, equation working uh, in the year 2050 for the cement industry. Um, so I think it is going to be essential uh, when it comes to la the last steps in terms of decarbonization. Um, there is uh, no doubt that uh, there will be residual emissions. Um, and I think that is something that we will also have to look at in Europe. Thank and I know you very that there are many countries that are open to that. So perhaps I could come to you and, and one point that, that uh, Arto didn't pick up on in terms of uh, one of the things John was calling for, standards. And we have a question saying, is there a role mm. for policy such as performance standards, quotas, product requirements, labelling in order to ensure the demand for ultra low carbon cement in future? Mm. In, when we come to this take up question, what are the levers that are most effective, do you think? Now, this is, uh, sorry, I... Hang on, I was going to ask Mechtild first and then I'll come ah. back to it in a little while. Mechtild. Okay, thank you. May I react just to, to the CCS, CCU question? Please do. Uh, because, uh, as, as John mentioned, and also uh, it was interesting to hear State Secretary Flatbird, I think, uh, as Arthur said, we need CCS for net zero, for the cement industry and other energy intensives or long distance transport. And I think the debate has shifted. Um, and uh, if we look at existing plans, I mean, we we'll often look in the future, what can be done? And there are a lot of options. There are much more than CCS. There are different technology options. But the existing cement plants today emit enormously. And they're relatively young. I mean, there are in, in Europe, they are 17, 18 years old. Uh, on average, and they have a lifespan of 40 years. So you need to find something uh, which captures and, and, and get the emission out before you can uh, have a solution maybe or other solution in the future. So we see, we came out with a major CCS report last year, uh, last week, uh, end utilization. So there are a couple of things around it, but for the cement industry and other energy intensive, we see a clear role here. And there are some good examples, but as as was mentioned as well, we need a scaling up. They are in the early phases. So whatever the government can do to help uh, scale up the project or to invest in this infrastructure, like it was mentioned also, I think there are a couple of things governments can help uh, to support that. And it's interesting, there is a question here saying, if we consider carbon storage as one of the high priorities to reach net zero, should we then only invest in plants that are closer to carbon storage facilities in the EU, which would mean those further away from those facilities will come later or should be closed? I don't know, maybe that's something, John, you can react to in a little while. But I wanted to stick with this question, Maria, if I might now, of the take up of low carbon uh, cement and the incentives. Uh, and we've talked about, John was talking about, you know, standards as one of those things. We've talked about a number of issues. What for you is the key here uh, to incentivize the take up of these products, which clearly then drives the business case for them? 
Maria, can you unmic yourself? Unmute, I mean, um, thank you. Hello, thank you very much. Before I answer to your question, uh, I would like uh, to uh, two comments to what have been said. Uh, on the waste burning, uh, reminds me that uh, there are uh, also more challenge to the cement uh, industry, apart from the climate, that most have been, uh, a lot of things have been done, but still, uh, many things uh, should uh, continue, many efforts. That is the, the, the quality, of, uh, the air quality, uh, that is also very important in, the, in this sector. Um, and the, 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 the particles emissions, uh, a lot has been uh, already uh, been done, but it's not uh, exactly the, the same level uh, all over, uh, all over Europe, and in all the uh, all the factories all over Europe. Uh, second point, I, I want to agree with Arthur that the the major efforts on uh, uh, research and innovation should be on demonstration, and the demonstration is very expensive, and we have we are putting a lot of hopes in uh, Horizon Europe, and uh, as we all know. We are having a big battle uh, with the council nowadays uh, for a, a larger budget. Uh, for the first time in history, we are not increasing the budget of Horizon, um, of Horizon to Europe compared with the previous one, the first time. Uh, and we are putting much more uh, ambitious uh, in, inside Horizon Europe uh, compared with the previous one. And one of them is uh, Horizon Europe is where uh, the big demonstrations, not only in the process industry like the cement, but also the solutions for aviation, for innovative medicine. So uh, a lot of hopes uh, uh, from Horizon Europe, a lot of solutions we expect for the Green Deal, for health, for uh, digitalization and we don't have the correspondent ambitions in the budget. So still not finished the negotiations, but I hope to have the, that the parliament that is united around that has uh, the help of uh, all the industry and uh, uh, to convince the member states that we need a, a, a better um, budget. I, I also think that uh, the innovation fund should have, should have a larger uh, budget, but uh, that is something that probably Arthur <laughs> would like to uh, to comment. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, uh, up to your question. Uh, uh, um, one of the incentives uh, uh, can come from the member states through the recovery plan. As you know, from the, the previous, the, the next budget, a lot of the high percentage of the budget is going to be run by the member states. Uh, and there is a lot of flexibility for the um, priority where the member states um, uh, want to, to, to allocate the money. And I think that this re the renovation way is, is a very good example where the, the member states. But uh, another point that we would like to see, uh, and we think that is a very interesting idea, is that there is a compensation uh, in terms of uh, uh, kind of uh, em uh, emissions uh, trade for the, the consumer, for the families, for the business that do the renovation in their own houses. They could, they could use this, what they, um, what they save in the renovation uh, and to have a kind of trade yeah. uh, 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 that is linked to the renovation itself. So it should be should be something uh, that uh, could be put in place and uh, will be together with the uh, economic incentive, financial incentive, uh, and interest mechanism Indeed. to incentivate the people to renovate. Yeah, something we're going to come back to. We're focusing very much on that issue in our next panel when we talk about the sustainable built environment. So we are going to come back on that. Judith, if I could just come back to you on, on what you talked at the beginning about. We need the policy and regulatory framework that keeps this work, these jobs in Europe. 
don't want to go back to the carbon leakage debate. We've discussed that. But for you, and addressing these questions around business models and business cases, what for you are the most important levers? I was quite struck. Uh, Maria was talking there about the role that the EU budget can play. And John did refer to uh, support in early stage technologies. But nevertheless, our audience, only 6% put funding as what they thought was the most important, I think, enabling policies, 12%. So more so the policies than the funding. What for you is most important? Is money important here? Or is it more that enabling environment? Yeah, and when I looked at that poll, I was definitely one of the people who ticked. Um, if I could have ticked, I would have ticked all of the above. <laughs> um, but, um, but it's clearly the uh, the policy framework is a jigsaw puzzle, isn't it, of different um, elements of policy. I think one of the um, key levers, which is far too uh, poorly represented often in this debate, is public procurement and the role that public procurement policies can play in actually um, supporting market opening for um, environment more environmentally sound um, and I should say socially responsible um uh, products and services and i think if we're looking at um in conjunction with the recovery plan and um, the rollout of large-scale investment across europe tying up some of the the dots and creating joined up policies between um those uh, internal market policies around uh, procurement and our our long-term objectives is actually really really important but on an industrial policy uh, perspective there are obviously um things like uh, regional clusters i i hear the point that maybe not all cement plants are in the same places as um, the other highly intensive industries um, but some of them are and it's possible to create um, joined up thinking between um, heavy industry in specific regions to pull um, technology and to pull the infrastructure costs um, together with local authority you know regional government uh, national government and eu um, programs we we just i think we need to have um, an ambitious vision of delivering on the ground. We know uh, up till now, one of our frustrations is lots of the debate is focused on the targets and focused on the numbers. Mm -hmm. And we're missing the detailed roadmap of how we deliver. Um, as a European industry, in the cement industry, in the steel industry, in, in other energy intensive industries. And we need to have that joined up policy framework, which uses all of the policy levers that we have um, across different areas to, to really push in the same direction. Um, so uh, for us, it's, uh, it's really, it's difficult. There's no silver bullet. We're not a, a moderator's dream. We're not, I'm not going to come and say this is the, the top number one priority. Um, but, um, but that joined up policy framework is absolutely crucial if we want to achieve the 2050. Let me just objectives. give Artur a chance to react to that. And then I want to take some more questions from the audience. Artur, she's missing a joined up framework. We have roadmaps done by the sectors. We're talking today about uh, the roadmap that SEM Bureau has produced, but she's missing the linkages between them all. Um, I think that's probably, um, I would agree with that because that is what we were missing for quite some time. Um, and it takes some time in order to really make these joined up plans because you need to bring together different industries in different places. Uh, but there start to be good examples. Um, and one that is often mentioned in these uh, discussion rounds is the port of Rotterdam, the port of Antwerp. Um, this is a huge industrial cluster um, where a lot can be done and will be done uh, because there is now an initiative that tries to drive that forward. And we are joining forces there because uh, this is certainly one of the first CO2 pipelines uh, we are going to assist in funding um, in that particular cluster. But we need to see that, of course, also in other parts of Europe. How much we will be able to do will depend on what Maria rightly said, um, how much money is going to be available for this, um, but also how member states are going to use the money. Uh, with the recovery, 750 billion euros is being placed in front of member states. That is a huge amount of money to be spent in two to three years. What it requires is shovel-ready projects. And that is where my worry is sometimes that 
uh, we have uh, and we see very nice brochures. Uh, as soon as you ask, so what's the plan? Uh, what's the price tag? Get it out of the drawer. And then people look into the drawer and they see there's just another nice and beautiful brochure lying there. So I think that is also something. And I think we have been pushing industry over the last two years when it comes to preparing for the innovation fund to say you need to come out with the plans. Maybe just a last yeah. word on the other elements of a policy framework. Whether you need to have additional policies will very much depend on whether your carbon price is going to be sufficient or not. Uh, so far in my discussions with the cement industry, uh, they are rightly saying, look, if I put uh, in front of the customer a bag of cement that is CO2 free and another one that has, is produced with CO2 emissions, the price difference is so small um, and it's even more expensive. Um, so it doesn't work at the present point in time. But now with increasing carbon prices, and uh, I'm pretty sure if the 55% is going to be adopted, we will see um, a further higher carbon price uh, developing, evolving over the coming years. Maybe we get to that tipping point, but we are not 100% sure. So uh, Maria, rest reassured, we are going to look in the impact assessment on whether we will need additional policy measures. And that could be like Judith was saying, uh, green procurement, uh, why should we not use um, eco cement for uh, the hospitals and the schools and when we spend the public money? Um, why should we not use this when we are promoting projects under the renovation wave? Yeah. Um, or other elements, uh, carbon um, contracts for difference have been mentioned as one of the things that could be tested. So these are all things that we will need to look at. And in terms of standards, um, even with the carbon border adjustment, you will have to look at standards and how things are being produced. So I think that is going to be an element uh, the Commission will have to work and on. Indeed, a question here, somebody saying on performance standards, um, you know, what role can they play? What more do we need to do? Well, I think, you see, if you want to do a, a, border, a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, in one way or the other, you will have to take um, performance into consideration. So this is uh, something we will have to work on in the coming years to make sure that we can differentiate between the different products. Is it a, a good cement or is it bad cement? <laughs> hey, um, I want to take some of the questions because lots and lots coming in. One quick comment though. Uh, somebody here begging, pleading Cedric de Meers for regulatory certainty. He says we're 100% committed. Some of us have pledged uh, to net zero with SBTI targets. Some of us are already putting carbon neutral concrete on the market today, but let's be honest, the biggest hurdle to go bigger and faster is regulatory uncertainty. Raises a lot of questions. I can't, don't have time to go through them all, but they're basically saying, don't know the answers to a lot of these questions. If we are to ramp up investments on a large scale and build our low carbon business case, we need answers. Let's construct this uh, together. But John, I want to come back to you on a question uh, that came from the audience about, um, so CO2 reduction, this is from Pieter van Gent, CO2 reduction along the concrete supply chain is often hindered by a hen or egg discussion, often related to the price cost of concrete. What for you is the most important driver of the change? Is it push through innovation by yourselves, by industry, or is it pull through demand by contractors and investors? So when we have this conversation about how do we drive this, is it, is it innovation driving this or is it at the pull from contractors and investment, the demand for those products? It's easy to say both, and that's a sort of cop-out, really, answer. Um, I think if you phrased it, the, look, the industry, look, I'm just, just scribbling here. I have seven, we have seven projects in our company alone of early stage uh, process improvement that um, will reduce our process emissions. Um, where we uh, have got um, various degrees of uh, national uh, government and, and other support to help us because it's not industrialized. So we're a bunch of engineers. We can do this and we can do the technology improvement. But the key point is we need the demand to change. Mm. So, so the, the, the things that were talked about, you know, public policy um, and um, uh, 
public procurement, they're good points. And, and uh, you know, we've got quite sophisticated uh, businesses in, in Europe and, and sales and marketing uh, colleagues uh, and people who understand um, all of the aspects talked about. If the demand was higher and driven by uh, public procurement, we, we respond very well to it. We have an example, for example, in the Netherlands, um, where they are driving down this path with public procurement, uh, being driving for low carbon uh, cements, and they're also linking that to the circular economy, which goes back to Maria's point, and, and are basically saying by 2030, the landfilling of uh, concrete demolition waste will be totally stopped. Great, bring it on. We can work with that type of environment. It doesn't cost anybody any real money. Um, and then respond well to that. So I would say the demand drivers um, are um, what we need to see um, and, and, and help in that, and we'll respond extremely well to it. Thank you. We have a couple of questions here about carbon capture storage. What do you do with the captured carbon? Do you just store it without any added value? Uh, and then a comment about what framework would enable the early planning and development of CO2 transport infrastructures? It would be needed as soon as possible for avoiding amounts of remaining processed CO2. A clear perspective on the timeline will be important. More of a comment there, but what do you do with that captured carbon? Uh, I think it's probably a question again for you, John, then I'll come to the others, I promise. Well, again, if you, from a company point of view, um, we want to uh, use it as much as we can, which we have within our company uh, four projects where we are, um, we've got industrial partnerships where we are trying to use it. And it's used in uh, drinks, uh, carbonated drinks, uh, so in, in the gas industry. Um, we are using it to, uh, combined with uh, hydrogen to produce um, um, fuels. We use it in enhanced oil reduction, uh, which is in the fracking industry, which is maybe not very politically uh, correct, but it is used in that. So we are trying to find usages uh, and, and doing an early stage good job in that um, before you store it. Okay. So, so back to the original point, storage is the last option. But yeah. that, an unavoidable last option that we need to start working on and raising public awareness. Storage offshore in projects that have been mentioned, the Rotterdam project, we're very familiar with that. Uh, the Northern Lights project in the North Sea, we're, we're a, a key part of that consortium uh, in our business. Um, but onshore storage needs to be moved from the, um, uh, from, from the politically, okay not very liked, but to, to, it needs to be accepted by the public. Um, another question, and perhaps Mechtild, one maybe for you. Um, on our road to 2050, how important is it that our carbon accounting takes full account of and doesn't discount source emission levels? These emissions are of course emitted in some form when reused. Is that something you can pick up on? I think we, we should avoid all kind of emissions if it's source emission or process emission or, or uh, whatever the emissions are there. So, but for the cement industry, the biggest part is the process emissions. So I, I'm not sure if that is, question is, is maybe drawn is better placed uh, for the cement industry, but uh, coming back to the storage one, yeah. I think, um, John explained very well. I mean, there, at the long run, we need to store, and that there are a couple of issues. It's the public acceptance issue, and uh, I think also the need to get together. And the example we heard, no company alone can do it, uh, nor an industry company, nor an energy company, nor even the private sector alone. So all these partnership clusters getting together, share costs is absolutely necessary. And we haven't seen enough in Europe. Netherlands ha has one or two with the port of Rotterdam and, and Antwerp. Norway is leading a lot on the CCS uh, front um, and, and the Northern Light is certainly a huge project where energy industry and Heidelberg Cement and the Norwegian government come together. We need to see more of that. And I, I, I'm a bit encouraged that with the net zero debate in Europe and the recognition that energy intensives need that technology in very specific cases, brings it forward and then if demand is coming up the the price the scaling up uh, could be possible um 
I think that I would have other comments, but on that is uh, this one. And Arto, one specifically to you uh, from Philippe Fonta. You mentioned that most of the money will be invested in the next two to three years and will have to be invested in on the shelf available solutions and not nice brochure solutions, as you put it. Typically, using the lever of public procurement is one of these solutions, and very little has been happening for years, although the technology is there. How can we scale that up? Public procurement being an issue Judith mentioned. Uh, how do we scale that up, use that lever more effectively? It was specifically to you, Arthur. Um, in terms of public procurement, um, I think that is certainly a lever uh, that is possible. Um, but I think when it comes to public procurement, it will in the end also come, okay, what's the price for the bag of cement uh, that is going to the market? Uh, taking all these things into account. Uh, because I can also see that um, many communes around Europe are saying, um, okay, now my uh, costs for building a school or a hospital or a kindergarten are going up. Um, who is going to pay me for that? So I think this is something we will have to look at uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months in order to see whether we can accelerate uh, the transition also in the cement sector. Uh, but we need to keep in mind um, the overall economics in terms of we need to do this in a very efficient manner. And if you look at the impact assessment we just did um, for the 2030 target, very clearly there is other emission reduction potentials in the economy that are still cheaper than going for carbon capture and storage in the cement industry. Uh, and they will have to be harvested first. So that leads to building more renewable energy and also um, renovating houses. Uh, where there is a clear priority when you look at the huge amount of investments that needs to be done. Um, so we need to do this also in a stepwise fashion that we end up with the cheapest bill that we can get to. Two issues we haven't touched on. Uh, I'd, li I'd, like, I'd like to come back on Judith's point about social justice and a just transition and what that means in this area. And the other issue I'd like to uh, talk about a little bit, it was touched on earlier, but we haven't really addressed it, is the importance of access to adequate, affordable supplies of alternative fuels of renewable energy, a clear area uh, where, where the industry needs help in order to do this. But first, on the social justice question, if I might, Judith, can I come back on that? Because I stopped you in mid-flow uh, because I wanted to get into the discussion. But what do you think is absolutely crucial to do? Just transition, very much something under the Green Deal that is talked about a lot. How in this sector do we make that a reality? Well, for, for us and for the um, trade union movement in general, um, there are basically four elements of a just transition and they apply um, across the board, uh, regardless of the sector. The first is the active participation of um, workers and the workforce and communities in developing transition plans. We know that decarbonization in the cement industry, in the steel industry, in the chemicals industry is going to have um, an enormous impact on what those industries will look like in the future. To, to pretend that every job will look exactly the same in 20 or 30 years time is to basically patronize um, the workforce and patronize the general population. So we know there is going to be substantive change and therefore we need to work together to manage that change. It's about anticipating what's coming and the impact that it will have on workplaces and on jobs and that then the broader impact on regional communities which depend on those workplaces um, and jobs. So um, so uh, participation, active engagement is the first element. The second we've talked about a lot this morning is a strong, sustainable industrial policy framework, which ensures that you have a roadmap that people can work to as much stability as possible. Um, obviously, you know, we can't can't predict everything in life, but there are some things that we can predict and um, ensuring that we have a framework with adequate resources, uh, which meets uh, the, the kind of overall objective and supports the transformation of industry. And the third key element is active labor market policies. Um, we will need workers who are able to work in the new technologies and the new parts of the industry uh, which we're talking about creating um, and that means that we need a substantive skills agenda 
looking at reskilling, upskilling, looking at what skills are necessary in which parts of the sector. There will be shifts within industries, um, within um, supply chains, and um, and that that basically demands a kind of tripartite planning between public authorities, industry, and the trade union movement and the workforce to ensure that um, this transition is as smooth and as fair as possible. Um, that's when we talk about just transition. That's what we're talking about ideally um, we have now within the framework the just transition fund which is uh, targeting carbon intensive um, industries we have uh, within DG Regio the agenda around um, regional policy and regional just transition um, plans um, we want to see all the energy intensive industries actively engaging okay. with their workforce in in that planning um, I'll get John quick chance to react on this point and how point how important this is for you and then these issues of skilling and upskilling and making sure as you innovate and continuously innovate you take your workforce with you and then I'd like to come back on the question of energy uh, renewable energy and alternative fuels but John yeah. um, I was listening carefully uh, to, to what Judith said um, and I think all of those points are very fair um, the the in a company that has uh, that is structured, in Germany, uh, with uh, very high level supervisory representation of our union colleagues, we work very collaboratively. So um, you know, I, I understand exactly where she's coming from and I would agree with that. Um, in terms of the, the active labor market policies in, inside a company upskilling, um, it means starting from uh, 16, 18 year olds with uh, continuing apprenticeship programs through the difficult times and the, and the easy times and then working through a full lifetime of improving and upskilling people. And it's not easy. In some countries, they're more industrialized than others, but we, we grab hold of the challenge inside our businesses and can cope with that and, and agree with that. Um, that's, a, that's the point. Thank you very much indeed. And just on this question of, of energy supply and alternative fuels, Mechtild, a thought for, on that, if you will, because clearly crucial as part of this industry living up to its responsibilities is that supply of renewable energy, alternative fuels. Are we doing enough? Do we need to do more? I think obviously if we can use more renewables energy efficiently, these are the first steps. I mean, uh, but there are technical limitation in uh, some of the energy uh, intensive uh, industries like the big big heat they need and that cannot be supplied at least right now with renewables or electrification uh, so we use more fossil fuel based and that's why we come how to can de uh, decarbonize that uh, but in the future as it was mentioned there are different combinations possible uh, either with carbon usage, uh, either with carbon storage, either with combination with hydrogen. We haven't spoken a lot about hydrogen today. Uh, so there are different technology pos possible. We are a big fan of um, renewables, energy efficiency, material efficiency, uh, also as much as possible, but there are limitations. And that's why we are discussing other technologies which are in an early stage, which we need to scale up. Yeah, I'm going to squeeze one in and then I need to draw some conclusion of the session, but it links exactly to what we're talking about. And a question to you, Otter. The cement industry is still discriminated against regarding compensation of indirect costs related to energy. And the questioner asks, do you think the European Commission will change its position? Uh, do you think uh, they are being discriminated against in this area? Um, kind of, I don't think so. Um, but I want to make another point that is important. If we look longer term um, and even looking beyond the year 2050 um, and all scientific journals I'm reading, uh, whether it's um, being peer reviewed by the IPCC or not, is telling us that we will have to have what is called negative emissions after 2050. And there's only very few technologies that do that. And one of those is the use of biomass um, and I think that is where I would even think the cement industry has a comparative advantage. If you link that with carbon capture and storage, then you have a perfect solution for those negative emissions. And kind of look at all the um, uh, kind of graphs you see uh, that go out until the year 2100. Um, it seems that we will need uh, loads of that. That's number one. A second point I want to make to Judy um, because um, if you look at it in the coming 10 years, uh, we were talking a lot about demand, 
uh, and the renovation wave will very clearly say we need to double the renovation rate in Europe. So we will not have a problem in terms of demand for cement. Um, I think we'd rather have a problem in having sufficient people working in the construction sector to make sure that we can double the renovation rate. So in that respect, um, upskilling and uh, getting new um, people working in the construction industry and using all the cement from the cement industry in the best way, okay. uh, in an efficient way, that is a big task and that is imminent. And think that something, something we will come back to, I hope, in our second panel. But we are almost out of time and I don't want to let you go uh, without putting you on the spot. And I'm going to take, Judy said earlier, I'm not a moderator's dream. I'm not going to give you one priority. Um, but let me put it a different way then to try and lure all of you in. And it's got to be very brief. Of all the things we've talked about, talked about a whole range of issues to do with financing, to do with enabling policies, to do with the level playing field. Um, all these issues we've talked about for each of you, if you had one priority uh, or one key next step, Judith, if you prefer it that way, uh, in order to deliver and really ensure that this sector can play the role you've all described for it uh, in the transition uh, to a low carbon economy. What for each of you the priority? And I'm going to ask you, and it's literally one minute each, one priority for policymakers and one priority for industry. I'm going to go in the reverse order to the way I started. So, John, uh, your priority for yourself as an industry and one for policymakers. And as I say, in under a minute, if you can, please. <laughs> OK, no problem. I'll keep it short and to the point. For industry, um, I think we all need to galvanize ourselves around a really coordinated message to improve the public perception of concrete as, as an essential truly sustainable material that can be a key part of the solution over the next 30 years and not part of the problem. I think we have a public perception challenge that we in the industry, and it's not reflected so much today because we're all within this world, need to really push home. It's an essential material. And then for policymakers, the introduction of a, a solid border adjustment mechanism in, in the very near term um, alongside phase four of the EU ETS. That's what we need to make business decisions. Thank you very much indeed. Mechtild, your priority for industry and for policymakers. For policymakers, what I heard today mostly is give stability, predictability, the right framework. And I think the EU, frankly, is well placed. The ETS, the European Green Deal, the net zero ambitions are a good step forward compared to many other regions in the world to give that stability, predictability, predictability even in the COVID times. And for industry? And for industry, I think pursue the efficiency and innovation they are doing. Pursue all the efforts they are putting in, in efficiency, material efficiency, innovation, openness for key technologies. Thank you very much. Judith, your two priorities. Yeah, um, I guess it's actually one uh, priority for both sides, and it's that question of um, public-private regional clustering um, and um, tying things up into um, strong transition plans um, between the cement industry and, um, and other industries to ensure that we get a rollout of the infrastructure um, that's needed and sharing of technologies, circular economy, everything else which comes with that. All ties together, job for both sides. Thank you very much. Maria, your key priority for you as a policymaker and for the industry. Uh, I would say that the, the priority is for both. Uh, um, and uh, I would put forward the development of uh, affordable, clean, uh, sustainable technologies so from the simpler ones we didn't talk here the energy efficiency for example in the clinker kiln that mm -hmm. is still a lot has been done but still a lot to be done to the more long term like the Arthur has mentioned the bio the biomass use together with CCU to the fantastic uh, uh, negative techno emissions technology that we really need to use and cement is a good example. Mm. So we have to create the conditions for that to happen. Thank you very much indeed. Arto, you have the last word. Your personal priority as a, a policy maker and the biggest priority, what you want from John and the industry. I think from John, I want um, yeah shovel ready projects, as many as we can get, uh, but putting them into the perspective of the whole transition over the next 30 years. 
because to think that uh, we can do things that can only be done in 2045 and come forward with them today, that is not going to be helpful. So the next step, that is the important thing. And on the side of the poli policymakers, and I'm not a policymaker, it's Maria and it's the member states, um, I want to have swift decision making, not tinkering around and going around the issues, but please make the decisions, make them before December. I probably should have described you as a policy shaper then instead of a policy <laughs> maker. Uh, but thank you for the correction there. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for a great discussion. I wish we'd had another hour because so many issues to discuss, so many questions coming in. We managed to touch on quite a few of them. Some were very specific, so I left them to one side. Some apply uh, to the next panel where we will come back, particularly on this question of the renovation wave, uh, particularly on this question of, of, of skills uh, and so on. Lots to discuss. We'll take some more of those questions later but thank you very much to you all the audience can't applaud you in these virtual times so i will do it on their behalf thank you so much uh, to you all we're going to take a 15 minute break now but don't go away don't log off Put your, I suggest you mute your camera and, uh, or mute, sorry, mute your microphone and maybe even turn off your camera if you're going to go and make a cup of tea or something. But we will be back here in 15 minutes for our second panel where we're going to focus on a sustainable built environment, a green deal for construction. So as I say, coming back on many of the issues we've been talking about, we have another great panel for you. So please don't go away. And thank you so much for all your questions. Apologies, I couldn't get to all of them so far. We'll see how we do in the next session. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And for the rest of you, I'll see you at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
ways to access to information. I have decided this press launch is uh, broadcasted through all our social channels to everybody around the world who is interested to follow the work energy of the publication. With this, uh, I would like to turn the floor to my colleague, uh, Mr. Gupta. Thank you very much, uh, Executive Director. And um, a few words then on the context, although this has been uh, very well covered already. Um, as was mentioned, we had two key questions to answer um, in this year's outlook. Um, how the pandemic might reshape the future of energy and how it might affect the prospects for rapid clean energy transitions. Um, and to do this, we had to answer or consider two key unknowns. Um, how long will the pandemic last and how are energy policymakers going to respond? Scenario approach to this work has never been more important. Um, there cannot be and there is never a single storyline about the future.
Okay, we have one minute to go if everybody's ready. Okay, welcome back. I hope everybody uh, has rejoined us and can hear me. Uh, so in our first session, we talked broadly about the role uh, of this industry uh, in Europe's economy, about the contribution it can make to the European Green Deal, about what it is doing, what the potential for the future is, but crucially, what it needs in order to realize all that potential. In this panel, we want to focus on one specific act aspect of that, namely a sustainable built environment, a Green Deal for construction. It was mentioned quite a lot in our first panel, uh, and so now we turn our attention to it. The construction sector is, of course, one of the key points in the European Commission's Circular Economy Action Plan, and cement is a key construction material uh, in this area. We had, uh, Raoul said in our first session, cement is a material of choice for greening the building stock. So, how is the sector already contributing to a smarter, more energy efficient, more reusable, recyclable built environment? And how much more could it do with the right frameworks in place? Again, we have a terrific panel uh, for you to discuss this. But before we do that, I again would like to get a snapshot of your opinion so I can feed this into our discussion. So perhaps we could put up the first question. Let's have a look at that first question for this panel if it's possible to get those questions up can we do so i'm ah there we are what is the biggest challenge or opportunity it depends how you see it challenges are often opportunities as well faced by the construction center is it for you developing low carbon construction materials reducing emissions through the entire life cycle of buildings digitalizing the construction sector developing circular and recyclable construction materials, or renovating the existing building stock to make it more energy efficient. So is it developing the materials, reducing emissions throughout the life cycle, digitalizing the construction sector, developing circular and recyclable materials, or renovating the, the existing building stock, which was an issue which was mentioned a great deal by our first panel. So five options there. I'll give you people still voting. So I'm going to give you a um, couple more seconds uh, in order to reply to that question. So construction materials, life cycles, digitalization, circular and recyclable construction materials, or renovating the building stock. Okay, let's close the voting on that one and let's have a look at the results. So, okay, uh, well, there is a clear, clear, strong uh, emerging winner on this one. 45% uh, of you thinking reducing carbon emissions through the entire life cycle of buildings is the most important. And that links back, Maria uh, Carvalho talked in the first panel about the vital importance of a life cycle approach. Uh, very interesting that 45% of you uh, think that's most important. In second place, but very close to uh, the next nearest one, uh, renovating the building stock, that's 20% of you. So 
less than half of, of, of the life cycle uh, thing, but nevertheless significant, and developing circular and recyclable construction materials, that 18% of you voted for that. Interestingly, talk a lot about the digital revolution at the moment, only 4% of you see that as crucial, and 13% developing those uh, low carbon construction materials. Um, so thank you very much for that one. Let us take the second question now. Perhaps we could have a look at that. So the second question, how best, coming back to this question of life cycle, emphasized as so important by many of you, how best to promote life cycle analysis in legislation? Any comparisons need to be made over the full life cycle of a building? Do you think that's the most important thing? Ensuring that achieving carbon neutrality in the built environment is central in building regulations. Is that the most important thing for you? Um, or is it encouraging all actors, especially architects and designers, to adopt sustainable, long-term, multi-life cycle thinking? Uh, so which is most important for you? Is it comparisons must be over the full life cycle? Achieve, assuring that this is central in all building regulations or encouraging all actors to adopt sustainable long-term multi-life cycle thinking. Most of you have voted. I'm just going to give it another couple of seconds and we will look at those results. Okay. Okay, I think we should end the polling there and let's have a quick look at those results. Okay, so 41% of you putting the emphasis here on encouraging all actors, especially architects and designers, to adopt sustainable long-term multi, so not just a life cycle approach, multi-life cycle approach, that use, reuse, designing uh, for reuse and dismantling. 33% uh, of you in second place are ensuring that this is central in all building regulations. And 25%, one in a quarter of you, saying comparisons need to be made over the full life cycle. But quite an even spread there compared with our last poll. Um, so it'd be interesting to discuss with our panel and find out what they thought of those two questions. So thank you very much for that. I think we shall uh, close that part of proceedings now. Uh, and let me introduce our panel. I'm delighted to welcome Kestusis Sadauskas. I always struggle with your name, Kestusis, I apologize. Uh, Director in the, for the Green Economy in the Directorate General for the Environment in the European Commission, Maria Spiraki, MEP, a member of the European Parliament's Industry, Research and Energy Committee. Great to have you with us. Uh, Laurie Barnes de Davin, who is Head of Research at Fast Carb. She's gonna tell you all about Fast Carb, I hope. Uh, she'll be talking to us about recycling and recarbonation, that bit that probably people know less about than the other four C's uh, in the Zen Bureau Roadmap. Uh, also with us, Per Klevnas, who is a partner in the consultancy Material Economics. And last but not least, Magali Anderson, Chief Sustainability, uh, Sustainability Officer at Lafarge Holchim. A very warm welcome to you as well. So as before, we're going to jump straight into the discussion. I'm going to ask them some questions. Uh, keep your questions coming in, but I should emphasize there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, if you can avoid the very, very specific scientific questions, keep them at the broader level, then we have more of a chance of tackling more of them and keep them as brief as you can so I can see what they are at a glance club them together even and get as many of them answered as we can. There are so many of you watching this event. It's great to have so many inputs coming in. But let's get straight under uh, underway. Kistusis, if I could turn to you first. Um, buildings account for over 36% of the EU's CO2 emissions. We all know that and 40% of its energy use. So in terms of, of the sustainable built environment. How important is this going to be, do you think, for achieving those overarching uh, objectives of the Green Deal, the long-term objectives, and how do you see the cement industry's role in all of this? Hello, everyone, um, and thanks for invitation. Um, so, going straight to the question, in fact, I would say that about 50% of our energy use um, and 45 to 50 percent of all carbon emissions are linked to the buildings that is what you get if you look at the full life cycle not just at the use phase and that's uh, i think what was coming out from the answers uh, in the poll that you have just made 
Um, and if we uh, um, uh, should look in this full life cycle, we'll see that the embodied energy and carbon play a very, very important role over the, over the full life cycle. And we know that life cycle considerations and circularity measures can drastically reduce this carbon. Uh, there was a recent study by European Environmental Agency that pointed to a reduction of these uh, emissions of about 60% by going circular. And uh, this is here where the cement industry can really play a decisive role because they are at the very center of it. And indeed, if we look into a broader picture, we see new opportunities where to cut down on the carbon. It's, it's opportunities. It's really not a problem, but really opportunities. Sometimes if we focus too narrow on the use phase, we miss out on the other possibilities that are out there. Thank you very much. So the figures, as you say, even more stark uh, than I uh, portrayed it. Maria, for you, the importance of this sector, if we are to tackle that issue, because this is already talking about some of the things we need to focus on. How important do you believe this sector will be for a sustainable built environment? Well, allow me just to, to add two, two numbers. It is important to say that 75% of the European building stock is energy inefficient and about 80% will be used until 2050 without any kind of technical innovation. In this regard, we are looking forward to the Commission's proposal, maybe tomorrow, and it is important to have two very, very important topics. The first one is how can we incentivize and how can we encourage the circularity of uh, construction materials and uh, uh, the circularity of the materials that we will use in the renovation way. In this regard, I think that the cement sector has a huge role to play in terms of uh, first reducing uh, its own energy consumption by using uh, raw materials, local raw materials, by using uh, uh, non recyclable carbon waste, by using uh, uh, materials that now are out of the, uh, out of the market. And the second one is how can we reduce the so-called embodied energy principle? How can we finally, finally reduce the energy that the cement sector is using? Allow me to say that uh, we can work on it because uh, I, you know there is a big question concerning how we can, can we replace the cement with, with other materials. But the case is the resilience as well. So we have to work in terms of recyclability, in terms of reducing the embodied energy, and in terms of uh, having a resilient uh, outcome from this effort. Mm. Thank you. We did talk in the in the first session about that that second question you raise about uh, reducing the amount of, of energy the sector is using. We touched on it. We didn't get into it in any detail, but this crucial question and guess is I won't ask you yet, but maybe you can tell us when we're going to get the details uh, of the renovation wave initiative, which everybody uh, underlines as being uh, so important here. But Laurie, from your perspective, and perhaps say two words about what fast carb is, uh, so that everybody knows, uh, and then in terms of the cement sector's role and the potential for it to play a really key role here, how do you see it? Uh, yes, yes, you're right, Jackie. Uh, I think we have an absolutely crucial role in this respect, especially considering the full value chain. Mm -hmm. Well, today, uh, concrete is recognized for being not only an efficient but a durable materials, but also it brings key advantages at the end of life. So I would emphasize on the life cycle approach, with, which will be very important because at the end of the life, uh, we have new qualities to the concrete, uh, such as recyclability and recarbonation. And these two properties, uh, that's uh, the properties we are promoting in the Fast Carb project, because Fast Carb is not only uh, a project which deals with circular economy, but also with carbon capture and, and storage. Mm. Um, recycling concrete is already effective throughout uh, Europe, but the quality of the recycled concrete aggregates can be even more improved by recarbonation. Of course, everybody knows that uh, recarbonation uh, happens all along the lifetime of buildings and infrastructure, but it can be accelerated at the end uh, of its life. And this is uh, one of the main objectives of the FASCAR project.
Mm. Thank you very much. We'll come back and I hope hear more about that a little bit later on. But Pear, for you, um, everybody agreeing an absolutely central role for this sector. So perhaps also we can build on that. Please do, do add a comment if you wish to. But on the challenges, uh, if we are to really maximise its benefits as a construction material, how do you see that? So many interesting strands here, and thanks for already a very interesting debate and discussion. Um, I'm joining you from Stockholm today, and um, around me here I can see several building projects going on, and I know that half of the footprint of those buildings uh, will sit in the construction phase, because heat and electricity, where I happen to be, are already substantially on the way towards decarbonisation. That is the context in which we have to discuss this. All sectors are moving, and, and every sector will need to move. And that, that, mean, that, that makes it very, you know, very important to talk about the construction phase. And we had great discussions. I really enjoyed the, the exchanges this morning on, on the production side of cement. Um, but, and, and you know, the compliment then in this session really is, uh, of course, we have to get as much value as we possibly can out of the cement that we do make. And cement is a fantastic material. If it costs twice as much as it did for some reason, uh, or production or otherwise, we would still use it. Um, it provides a lot of value for the price that it has. But we then face a, face a very interesting question of the onward translation of that value down to uh, construction. We, we mentioned the statistic here that earlier that you know, there are 35,000 people working in the cement business, but 13 million in construction. And that mirrors the myriad of decisions that need to be made if we are going to use less cement, but with the same maintained value and, and with the, where that value ends up in the value chain. And I think that's something we need to talk quite a lot about. The opportunities of reuse have been mentioned. There are also opportunities to use other binders or to use less binder in cement. There is uh, opportunities um, for, for you to use less concrete. Uh, and these are just like energy efficiencies distributed all around the economy, lots and lots of decision makers, uh, a potential that we don't always know how to, to capture. Uh, we have the same thing with materials efficiency, not just for cement, um, for many other materials too, uh, but certainly also in the construction sector. Thank you very much. And interesting because there was a comment in our last panel and you talked about the cost, uh, uh, the price of cement and uh, reacting to uh, our commission spokesman in the last, as well, official in the last panel, somebody said uh, Arta is concerned over the price of cement, but this is a relatively small component of the overall construction cost. But you're saying that even if it wasn't, people would use it because it has so many valuable properties. Lots to come back on our discussion, but Magali, uh, complete the picture for us in terms of of how you see the role of your sector in this area and what for you are the most important challenges we need to address for you to play that role to the full. So first, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Very happy to be here with you today sharing those ideas. And uh, you know, you said challenges can be opportunities. I see a world of opportunities here. I don't see challenges. And uh, maybe because I'm an engineer and uh, engineers love those opportunities and loves working on it. I think a lot of things have been said already in the previous session and, and, and by the people who answered here, but what, what I would add is, I think we, we can reach easily an agreement why cement and concrete is so important and why it's here to stay. But we can also reach an agreement that we need to all work together to make that work. We know that it's here to stay. We know that volume are going to increase, even though we should think of looking at performance versus volume, but. Uh, the amount of construction that's going to happen is huge. When we look at the mega trend, I'm sure you know them all, the famous 2 billion people moving to urban areas in the next 30 years, 60% of it needed to be constructed. So if you look at all of this, it's everyone's interest to make that work. And everyone's interest means all working together between uh, the policy makers, the designers, and as uh, the material um, providers, and uh, the, the great thing is all the parameters are here. All the lights are green right now. We have the EU Green Deal. We have everything that is happening right now. If we miss that opportunity, it's criminal. We cannot miss it. We, we have to all get together, be in it, and, uh, and, and yeah, transform this challenge in incredible opportunity. 
So you mentioned that raft of initiatives. You said all the lights are green. I mean, there is just it's, it's an enormous amount going on in this area. With I'm hoping we'll get a glimpse uh, from you into the details of the Renovation Wave Initiative, which everybody is saying is so important. And indeed, we had a question right at the beginning of the first session, uh, talking about you know how can we increase the pace of renovation. Uh, so I'll be very interested to hear what you have on that. But we also have lots of other things. Um, we have the Circular Economy Action plan itself. We have the buildings level initiative, uh, the energy performance in buildings directive still being implemented, construction products regulation, as well as the renovation wave, a whole raft of initiatives in this area. How do you see them uh, and how do you see the connections between them? Do you think we, we are on the right track and, and with all these elements we have the right levers in place to, to really uh, achieve the targets here? Yes, um, uh, I do believe that um, we are getting ourselves the instruments, the policy instruments, um, putting everything together, making sure that different actors talk to each other, also that our uh, legislation is conducive to achieving these goals. So we have to bring everything, um, uh, again, aligned, um, uh, consistent, and uh, renovation wave will be really one of the big uh, deliverables uh, due to be out, to, I think tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, in any case, the, the, the commission will be finalizing it tomorrow. And uh, yes, it's, it's one of the flagships of, uh, of the Green Deal, which will be um, aiming at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, increasing the renovation um, uh, pace um, and uh, also making sure that it's done sustainably uh, sustainably, not also from the environmental point of view, but also from the social point of view, because everything has to be affordable. Um, of course, the energy efficiency would be the paramount uh, principle here, but at the same time, we will be uh, declaring that we will be uh, abiding by a number of, uh, of other key principles, uh, such as decarbonization, integration of renewables, such as life cycle thinking and circularity, such as health and environmental standards, or tackling the, uh, again, the uh, twin challenges of green and digital transitions. And of course, looking at uh, what Europe is very special about, that's aesthetics and architectural quality. Um, so all these things have to, have to come together and, <laughs> and make sure that uh, uh, what we do now is, uh, is going to last for a very long time. And at the same time, we'll start delivering on our long-term uh, climate neutrality goals already from, from the next days. So I, I, I suggest that you, you need to wait uh, for the details to be revealed. There is no point of speculating, you know, and, and keeping the suspense here because it's a matter of hours. <laughs> you see all the details and you will be able really to go I down know, but you that. can't blame me for trying to get a sneak preview. I know, I know, I know, I know. Details. But Maria, generally speaking and broadly, with the Renovation Wave initiative, we know the broad outlines, uh, Kestus is pointing to it there, and these other initiatives I was mentioning, do you think we have the right instruments in place? Is there anything missing? Yes, implementation. <laughs> and that will be very clear. According to, to the latest report that the Commission uh, has uh, already presented uh, in the Parliament, only a half of the member states are on track in terms of uh, addressing the targets for uh, en energy and renovation by 2020. Mm. So we need to speed up and we need to increase the, the rate. It is approximately 1.2, it is the best scenario. It starts from 0 0.4 and uh, uh, reached to 1.2. And of course, we know that uh, we need uh, at least 3% concerning uh, public buildings. In this regard, I think that the, the, new, uh, the, the new legislative framework will work as a catalyst, but it remains to be seen in terms of uh, specific issues. For example, ETS. Shall the Commission include buildings in the ETS sector? And how it will work? It will work in terms of uh, EU level or in terms of member states in order to facilitate uh, uh, energy upgrade of uh, social buildings or energy upgrade of, uh, of neighborhoods that they are suffering from energy poverty. And uh, second, what about the so-called uh, uh, building passport? Shall the Commission finally 
accept the proposal coming from the parliament, I have already included in my, in, in my opinion that it has been accepted by the ENVI committee with a vast majority. Shall the Commission will finally include this kind of, of tools, of instruments, in order to avoid the fragmentation of the market and at the same time in order to increase the value of renovating buildings with circular and resilient uh, materials? This is the case for me. And I think that we have to wait. Of course, there are a lot of rumors and we have some information, but uh, we have to wait some hours, maybe one day, not more. But for you, fundamentally right approach, right tools, lack of implementation so far. Magali, would you agree with that? What do you, do you, do you think the EU is on the right track here? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, we still need to see for some few details as it was mentioned before. I think it is. Um, I find it, maybe, maybe it's my character, I'm, I'm quite energetic, and so I find it a bit slow, in all fairness. I think uh, maybe uh, if we could speed up some of the things that are happening, but if we look at just the last 24 months, how things have changed, and maybe I will look at it more myself on a market point of view. If I look at uh, the market for green cements, uh, we've launched um, Ecopact, which is, uh, um, sorry, it's actually green concrete, but, uh, um, and I think, even two years ago, the, the acceptance of the market would have been different. So, so we see the market seems to, to get there. It's, it's, um, I, I'm being asked regularly, is the market there? And I'm like, I can't really say it is because I can't really say I'm saying a huge quantity of it, but, but it's coming. And we start seeing all these uh, obligation from public sector to have a CO2, um, or, or CO2 requirement when they do infrastructure building all of this is all good. It's not in enough countries yet, and I find it too slow. So I agree with that, but I think the signals are pretty good. Thank you. Laurie, if I could come to you, because in terms of, of the work you're doing in your project, do you feel you have the right policy environment around you, the, the most enabling environment uh, that there could be in order for your project to succeed? Well, I, I would say that a key thing would be to recognize recarbonation because it's not the case for the moment. Uh, there's no legislation recognizing the recarbonation of concrete. And uh, on the other end, I, I would like a way to incentivize market player uh, to really take into account uh, that when uh, demolishing buildings, uh, you, you can store lots of CO2. So I, I would uh, encourage market player to include recarbonation in their building designs. It's once again a view uh, all along the life cycle of the buildings. And if I could just follow up on that, why do you think it isn't at the moment? Is it a lack of awareness uh, of the potential here? What is, what is holding you back? Yes, I, I think you're right. It is probably that we have to talk more about this phenomenon because it happens naturally throughout the lifetime of, of the buildings. But, um, uh, the, the quantity of CO2 we could store in, CO, in concrete, it, it's, it's huge and it could be done every day all around the world. So uh, it's a low hanging fruit, I, I would say. Thanks. And uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no. Uh, is there anything else in terms of, of, of that enabling environment? Are there other challenges that you face in your project where you need more support, whether it be, I was quite struck in the last panel how people, when they were talking about innovation, put financing as a relatively low need. It was much more about, about policies. Um, do, is there anything else you need to, to, to drive this project forward and really succeed? I think, yeah, it's been said already, but uh, collaboration throughout the value chain is essential. Um, for example, between material suppliers, structural engineers, builders, and architects. Um, in the FASCAR project, uh, we have uh, members of uh, the whole value chains involved, and they all acknowledge the value that recarbonation will bring to the construction in industry in their decarbonization roadmap. So... Uh, complete the picture for, for me in, in terms of your assessment. Do you agree with, yes, I think general feeling um, is we have the fundamental tools we need. I think maybe Laurie's saying there we could do more on recarbonation. We don't really know enough or there isn't enough awareness, but generally more implementation. It's too slow, but it's fundamentally right, the right approach. Would you agree with that? Well, let, let me be the difficult guy then and say, no, I don't think so, actually. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that if you're, I mean, starting on all the potentials we're talking about here, I mean, if you are 
if you really want to uh, drive innovation, we are lacking the niche markets in concrete and cement, much like we are in, in other energy intensive materials and so on. It's very, it's very difficult to, to see uh, how companies are going to be able to take the next step without a big step change in policy. We talked about public procurement for a long time and it's, it is difficult with construction materials because market offer regional and local, but nonetheless, it's something where we haven't moved ahead and there are no, it's not implemented in a big scale. And so I think there's massive amounts to do there on the demand side to enable the innovation. I'm not talking about the mass, mar mass market deployment that will come in due course, but to enable innovation in the first place. Second thing I'd say is that um, if we go away from what we talked about in the first section and we talk a little, in a, just a little bit more detail about the, the potential here, I mean, the renovation wave, I would be the last person in the world to say that that isn't a great idea and isn't overdue. It absolutely is. But that isn't solving the issue of how we uh, move forward with a net uh, climate neutrality for the cement sector. That is solving the end for the energy system. We need to also talk about the analogous issue in the case of construction materials. And the analogous issue here is we should not just look at the supply side. We should also look at the demand side. We would never dream of looking at the energy transition and say we will solve it entirely by, by decarbonizing supply and we can ignore the demand side. Our very discussion here shows that the demand side is hugely important for energy. I would say the same is true for materials, same is true for cement and concrete. We talked about demolition. 70% or so often of a building's footprints uh, in terms of the materials footprint of CO2 sits in the structural components that you tear down when you demolish a building. Uh, and there's a big potential not to do that, to, to recondition instead. That's mm -hmm. expensive. It will not happen unless we have the right policies in place. Um, we talk about reuse. It is experimental at most. We are decades overdue in really looking at it as a possibility. Digitalization can help, but the sector is slow to move. We need support. Uh, another untapped potential. You talk to just about any post-mortem on modern buildings across a range of classes, and you look at the concrete use, and you will find that compared to what you could do, it is often cheaper, contractually easier, more time efficient, fitting into existing structures to use more materials to compromise on other, to, not to compromise on other parameters. Again, an area of just efficiency of materials used that we could really look at. And finally, there are lots of techniques, research tells us, uh, shown again and again in the lab, for using less cement in concrete, less binder, mm -hmm. less of the glue, and without compromising on performance. Um, and no, no, if I step back here, of course, you know, the energy industry has been very challenged by saying efficiency is really important, but has come to terms with this and has also found ways, even if you're an energy supplier, to go downstream in the value chain and to make money downstream of the, in the value chain from energy efficiency, from charging points, from various other things you diversify. I think the cement sector needs to embrace this agenda uh, of materials efficiency, of really efficient, maximized value use of their own product in order to uh, in order to really be part of this transition. Okay, so lots of challenges there, Kestusis. Um, up until there, it was going well for you. <laughs> they thought you were on the right track, but it is too... I mean, how do you react first we'll come, uh, 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 to, the, to those who say, yes, but we need to implement better and we need to be faster? Uh, and then those broader criticisms that the pair's making uh, in a range of areas, very struck particularly by him saying, so much focus on the supply side and not enough on the demand. And we have questions, in fact, from our audience, one about public procurement. It was mentioned uh, in the first session and perhaps come back to that in a moment. But broadly, how do you react to that sort of school report, as it were, on how you're doing? Yes, I, I think everything that was brought up here uh, by all panelists is all relevant. And again, you will see all of these things come together in the, in the Renovation Wave initiative. Um, but also in the initiatives that will follow from it, because it will be uh, also a, let's say a strategy with certain actions that will be rolled out in the next uh, several years. So for example, uh, what uh, Wendy Gesperak was mentioning on the, on the passport, I think it's likely to come out there. We've listened to the parliament and also to, 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 the, to the sector. Uh, also the consideration on ETS, um, uh, you know, again, subject to confirmation by, by the commissioners tomorrow, because you will have to discuss it. But, uh, but I see a high probability coming out uh, from it. And indeed, implementation, you know, one thing is to write a nice strategy, but the other thing is how is it going to happen? And is everybody aware? Is everybody really fully aligned? And that's why I also agree that, uh, that we have to look at, at the supply, at the demand side, at the operational part as well. That's why we, we keep on talking about this life cycle part, which uh, may uh, sound very generic, but in fact, it's very, very real. 
uh, because that's precisely where the troubles really are and where the, uh, where the opportunities really exist. And speaking about the demand, one of the ideas that you know, we've been thinking and talking about for I think a number of years is public procurement as a signal from public authorities spending uh, close to, uh, let's say, 2 trillion euro altogether. And a lot of that, in fact, most of that is for the buildings is to make sure that we send the signal to the market, uh, to the developers, to the architects, to the producers that we want something else, or let's say they want something that is more sustainable. So, so indeed, public procurement will be part of that, uh, uh, <coughs> of that picture. And in fact, in the previous question, you mentioned levels. Indeed, levels is, is a very, very important initiative. Uh, this is what my department is responsible for. We have run pilot for five years now with very uh, good and extremely uh, valuable input from, from SEM Bureau, from, from our cement uh, uh, association here. And we will be um, sort of launching the new phase of it on Thursday, uh, meaning that we go from more pilot to inviting people to use more of it because it will give a different picture. It will align the needs of architects, of builders, of developers, of, uh, of the construction workers, but also those that work on the afterlife and mm. thinking about what to do after that. And in fact, the question that, uh, that they see is indeed about the, uh, the recyclability. Yeah. Because it's not only the, uh, the, the renovation weight that we want to achieve and we want to sort of ride on it, but also we want to avoid a waste waste. Uh, because if we all of a sudden start demolishing things, uh, then what happens with it? In fact, we want to get away with the word demolition altogether. What we need to talk about is deconstruction. That's, that's the name of it. Huh? Mm -hmm. Because we take things apart and then we, uh, uh, we either recycle or reuse, reuse directly very valuable materials that usually we find ourselves uh, around. And by the way, cement and concrete is, is one of these. So indeed, a lot of systemic thinking, lots of systemic changes will have to come out from it, not only in forging forward with a major renovation uh, action, you know, going, uh, you know, full speed, but also doing it in the right way. Thank you very much. Uh, Laurie, I saw you nodding uh, vigorously there. Did you want to react on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I can only agree uh, um, what was said um, just now by the previous uh, um, panelist. Um, yes, uh, what I wanted to say is that sometimes we talk about design for construction, for reconstruction, but I think we, we should think also about design for destruction. Uh, because, um, as I've just said, uh, concrete has a high potential to store a huge amount of CO2. And um, uh, if we want to use it uh, fully, uh, we have to think about what we will do uh, at the end of the life of the, of the buildings. And, uh, of course, concrete is 100% recyclable. Uh, it can go uh, into road construction, but it can also go into uh, into new concretes. And uh, what are better things that have a, a storage, of, a permanent storage of CO2 into uh, new uh, building materials? So I fully agree about the systemic. Uh, can systemic. I jump in for half a second here, just to complement what Laurie just said and. I thought, Laurie, it was funny when you said earlier, everyone understands the recarbonation. I think people on this panel do. So most people who listen to us do, but I'm not sure everyone does. Uh, now, I just wanted to have a quick jump in here about a product we just launched in Switzerland called Susteno, which it's a cement that contains 20% construction demolition waste in it. Mm. And so, so we actually can make it as early as, a, as the cement, not just as an as a aggregate or things like that. We can put it in. And guess what? We could make it more, but we can't because uh, the local uh, legislation does not allow us to pass the 20% mark. So it's not a scientific technical uh, barrier we have here. It's what a legislation barrier. Magali, but what's the reason for that? That's just how it is. And we are working, we are working on it now to change it. But I think it, it's certainly something that uh, is a bit from the past where they, people thought they needed to put rules to make sure that uh, you know, the cement we produce will, will hold, make buildings that will hold with time. And maybe they don't take the time to consult the scientists. But this is why I think green deals and all these big movements that's happening will force governments to go back to those and think, hey, maybe we need to revise that and go back to it. And we are working. I mean, so I was, I was the in our sector has to work with it. I was going to ask, you know, what you saw as the most important policy levers to incentivize product circularity, but actually maybe I should put it the other way around and say, what are the key things we need to do 
to not put barriers in the way uh, of this. Maria, your thoughts on, on this broad discussion we're having and perhaps specifically to the renovation wave, what are you hoping to see uh, when the uh, detailed proposal is unveiled this week? First, promoting circularity. And I think that labeling is a way to go forward because uh, the example that has given right now is important to understand that we can promote uh, circular products, products that they are uh, recyclable and reusable, and we have to, to upgrade the existing legislation, and we have to encourage member states in order to upgrade the existing legislation. Second, I insist on the, on the performance. And I think that we have uh, not only to, to raise awareness, but also to engage uh, uh, local authorities and to promote uh, large scale projects, especially projects that they are tackling energy poverty, especially projects that they are renovating uh, 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 archaeological sites or, uh, or sites that they are uh, close to, to, to our European culture. But the case for me, and I would like to, 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 to conclude with this, is the way that we are, we are approaching the issue of building renovation. And I think we have to have a holistic approach, an approach that is focusing on, on creating greener buildings, on creating more circular buildings with more circular materials, and finally on, the, on, on diminishing and finally on, on having a, a, a zero waste economy coming, coming from buildings. And in this regard, I think that we have the proper uh, legal instruments, but we need the facilities that it comes from the funding sector. We have to use all the existing uh, funding instruments in terms of uh, recovery and resilient facility. I think that it is an easy way of reco for recovery, especially for countries like mine. Uh, we face uh, a kind of recession that it will, it will uh, reach 20% for, for this year. So it is important to, to use re the recovery and resilient facility, the, the multi-annual financial frameworks that will come by the end of uh, this year, we, we hope so. And we have to, 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 to create large scale projects in terms of renovation according to the, to the parameters that I have already described. Thank you very much. Pair, on this question of, of levers to incentivize uh, product circularity, what do you see as key here? Sorry, you mean at, at what level? In um, terms of the development of products, you know, really fostering this in terms of the materials we're developing, which was something that, that uh, many of our uh, speakers that, that emphasized was, was an important aspect of it. And some one in five picked it as their most important circularity, yeah. recyclability of materials. What do yeah. we need to do to incentivize that? Uh, first, to incentivize the production, the innovation uh, needed, the business model for it. And then on the other side, the take up of it. Yeah. No, and, and I, I think here, uh, you know, we again, if we make the uh, if we make the comparison with energy efficiency, we have, we have mapped potentials and put in place frameworks and so on since the 1970s, spurred by the oil crisis. We are very late to the party here, right? Um, we really ought to have done much more in this uh, in this um, in the past. But a few a few things that I think can really help. I mean, one we we may, we I'm, I was sorry to see digitalization so low on the list mm. here, and I think that if I reframe the question, maybe it would be it would be higher up the list because you know, the construction sector, as we have talked about here, has has lots and lots of things it needs to serve society with, um, from beauty to shelter to other things. Um, but it also has its own problems, and one of them is a productivity gap that is phenomenal if you compare to many other sectors of the economy. It isn't, if productivity isn't improving. And digitalization will come, and will come in, in ways that perhaps we don't expect here. And that will make it much more possible to trace materials, to, to label, to, to know what we're putting in buildings, what is in, are in buildings, and, and ways to keep track of that. So that's one thing that will come and, and help, I think. Another one is, frankly, all the, a lot is now being driven by really quite small initiatives, local uh, on um, on trying out a plethora of different uh, business, new business models, as you alluded to, one of those will be um, will be reuse models and, and so on. Um, but but there really isn't a sort of scaling and integration of the supply chain yet. And I think that we really need to find a way to get uptake of this um, much more widely throughout the throughout the supply chain. And finally, then I, I mean, I, I, we we are keen on labelling. We label for fire safety. We label for structure integrity. We label, perhaps, we will label for carbon. I think I see no reason why we shouldn't also start uh, providing the information on the circularity part. We mm -hmm. talk a lot about um, the design here. Buildings, as as we've already heard, a lot of the buildings we will have for a long time are already with us. 
but at, at the minimum when we now do new construction and meet new needs, that we at that point um, really make sure that we implement the circularity principles that are already being tried and tested. Thank you very much. There's a number of questions here relating really to this issue. Somebody saying current European standards prescribe cement recipes, including clinker, recycled content, etc. Performance should be the basis of acceptance. Is there a consensus we should move towards that? Again, and I mentioned it earlier uh, as an incentive, uh, when will the Commission look to make some basic green public procurement uh, criteria mandatory for member states and another one relating to procurement. Public procurement is obviously important as a transaction starter, but without private procurement for low carbon buildings, we will not really move ahead, says Jan Sundergaard Hansen. The problem is the CO2 agenda is a political agenda not driven by private demand. There is no real financial value in building low carbon buildings, therefore we need regulations to drive change. When will we accept this in the industry, he says. I wonder, do you, do you agree? Uh, but Kistusis, your reaction uh, to, to those questions, and particularly, I say a lot of questions coming in about public procurement, but also standards in all of this. Your mic is off, Kistusis. Yes, yes, um, thank you. Uh, yes, as, as now I think there is consensus that it's got to be a systemic um, uh, systemic and holistic approach means that everything is been, being mentioned has, has a value indeed, for instance, standards and the product quality as such. Uh, let's say looking at the quality, recyclability, the sustainability of the construction products that go into the buildings that we're going to use, that's, uh, that's absolutely key because if we, uh, um, if we embed those products for long years, for many years, into the buildings, then clearly um, there has to be really the best that, uh, that there is. But for that, uh, there has to be also a policy drive, a policy uh, signal, because I fully agree that by itself, it's not going to happen. I would probably call it, you know, for now it's a market failure because there was no incentive. Everybody understands that we've got to do something, but why would anybody try to invest into something if they are not sure they will be rewarded for this? So we have to make sure that the system does reward. Uh, for the uh, for, for the good behavior. But also, again, coming uh, coming back to this renovation um, uh, renovation wave and all together the buildings uh, uh, sector. You know, again, the renovation renovation will have a value if it's a deep renovation. If it's not just superficial one, but the, the word deep is absolutely key here. Because if we are just to put a plaster on the building and to make it not recyclable in the future or to deteriorate the quality of the indoor air it's really not going to help. In fact, if anything, it would discredit the whole idea. So we have to make sure that we renovate extremely deeply, that it's not only the energy efficiency process that we'll look at, but uh, for example, we need to remove the lead pipes that, uh, that um, uh, we use for the water supply or some electrical appliances, for example, the mercury lamps that have to go out of, of our buildings that are still there in most public buildings and for which the time is really up and uh, for which there are very good alternatives also have to be removed there. So we really have to look into lots of things. And, and, and the good news about this is that um, all of this activity would create jobs, would create economic activity. And that's really a good news in these times when, uh, when our economies are dwindling and where we need to inject uh, really uh, some, some dynamism and uh, adrenaline, I would say, into the economy. Otherwise, We'll be facing. And maybe one more thing is that if we do it right, if we set the standards right, um, I'm pretty sure that this will also send a major wave uh, to globally, huh? because people will be looking at us. And uh, if we do it right, if, we, if we're successful, this will open up also the markets for our products. Because if we prove that our products do deliver carbon neutrality, do deliver good efficiency, material, material efficiency, good quality of this, this is what will be wanted also in global markets and will open up new, new avenues for our businesses and our producers. So Magali, he says, if we do it right, what do we need to do to do it right? And can I, in your answer, can you just pick up, one questioner is saying the local legislation you talked to about the 20% uh, level, what legislation is that? That's a very- That's in Switzerland here. Broadly, how do we do it right? What do you need? What will be the policy signals you want to see? So the, the, the sustainable example is a Switzerland example. And by the way, I'm certainly not criticizing Switzerland where I'm sitting right now because they are very progressive in a lot of their rules. Just that one 
we need some progress. And um, but I just want to make a quick comment before I answer that on the on the public demand. Sorry, yeah. the private uh, demand. Maybe call me uh, eternal optimistic, and and I'm happy with that. But I think it's going to change, and the reason why I think it's going to change is because all companies now are coming up with some kind of pledge, mm. and they have to. And um, the beauty of that is that I am the scope one. I'm sorry, my scope one is a scope three of someone else. So, and I hope this is clear, everyone understand that. I, I am assuming I'm, I'm expert on scope one, two, three here. So when Skoska came up with a pledge saying that they want to come to carbon neutrality by 2045, if I'm not mistaken, that's on their scope three. And they need me as my, as they need my scope one to reduce. So they will have no other choice to reach their commitment than to start putting in the private sector to start making sure there is a demand for green concrete because they will create that demand. So I'm a bit more optimistic <laughs> than we are. I agree, it's only signals right now. Um, for the rest of the legislation, I'm not sure, I'm not as expert as the people on the panel to go into details, but mm. my request would just be, you know, we need this, we need cement and concrete. You need it for renovation. You need it for everything. We need circularity because it's a fully recyclable. And myself, when I see a building, I see future stock for my recyclable to put in my concrete and cement. So again, I see opportunities everywhere. And we need to make sure that all the legislation are incentivized us, us to do it and not the contrary. And unfortunately, it's not always the case. And I think there needs to be a rethinking. What, what, in, what incentivizes you and what is not the case. What's well, some of the things we have said, such as in the public sector, to make sure that we th there is a real requirement for uh, green cement and green concrete. You know, I spend 50% of our R&D goes into innovation for, for green products. I need, so the board asked me when we came with our pledge last uh, three weeks ago, the board asked us, what's the market? Why are you doing it other than it's a good thing to do? You know, and, and I need to be able to answer those questions. So I need to show that we have no choice. It's, it's a survival for our company. If I manage to prove that, then I have a motorway in front of me. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of questions I want to take from the audience and maybe Maria to raise something that we haven't talked about really today at all, which is the role of the end user, the consumer, the individual citizen. Question here saying, what is the role of the end user in this transition? Uh, the effect of an individual citizen renovating their own house with low carbon products is arguably almost negligible, says the questioner, in comparison to the leverage of large public projects, schools, hospitals, infrastructure. Is it nevertheless relevant to talk about end user involvement in driving this transition and if it does what implications does that have for the desired policy framework very very interesting question because i strongly believe in on the role of end users especially that it can drive uh, the industry to a greener path and in this regard i think that uh, setting a standard is one of the ambitions that we have to have in the cement sector as well as European Union. We are a leading economy, we are a leading market, and we can set the green standards in order to, to increase the demand of greener cement. And in this regard, the border adjusted mechanism, it is, it is the instrument that we will use in order to, to create a level playing field in terms of, uh, of our heavy industry, will facilitate us in order to produce greener, greener cement and greener products. Of course, the end users are driving the market because the end users are now looking for green products because the end users are very, very sensitive in terms of carbon footprint. In this regard, we have to encourage the, the, the industry to produce more greener products and to encourage the cement industry to produce more green cement in order to cover the demand. And uh, I heard from the previous speaker that uh, they, they, they spent approximately 50% of their budget for R&D. So it is important also to, to facilitate and encourage R&D. We cannot accept, for example, the proposal that it comes from the European Council for more cuts for, for, Horizon, 20, uh, for Horizon Europe. We cannot accept cutting uh, specific projects that they are facilitating R&D. 
it is important to have proper funding for R&D in terms of EU funding. It is important to encourage the, the, the cement sector and the industry for, for more greener pro production. And it is important also to create a level plate field concerning the global market in order to have a, a, a fair competitiveness and to, to provide to our, to our end users affordable projects. Because the case is they have finally to buy, they have finally to pay for it. <laughs> Um, just a question I uh, hear from DG Klima, and maybe I don't know, Paris, this is something you could help us with. Sustainability also includes resilience to the impacts of future climate, and the Green Deal foresees a new EU climate adaptation strategy. Uh, then it talks about con concrete structures need to resist future climate averages and extremes throughout their long life, but applicable industry standards are based on historical average averages. Do you agree it would be urgent to use climate projections for safety and durability. And this comes from someone who works in the adaptation unit of DG Klima, so really wants to know the answer. I don't know whether you, Pair, can help with this one or anybody else can pick up on this point. Are we can, taking enough account of climate adaptation here? I, I, can, I can offer a comment. Let me, let me just, if that's okay, Jackie, just, just mention uh, a, a couple of things that I think are important here. One of our questions we had was about standards of how we specify concrete. Um, a fundamental circular economy principle is that we should look at performance and ways to deliver what we actually care about at the end. Those standards are standing in the way of that now. And in Denmark is the one country in the whole of the in the whole of the EU uh, that doesn't that, that has a much lower lower requirement on how much you should use. And this is of course the standards are there for a reason. Of course we need to carefully do it, but we need to open that can and look inside and see what we can do. Um, and also, I, I do want to make the comment that we say we keep saying here now that cement is infinite is uh, fully recyclable. Mm. It isn't recyclable in the sense that you can recycle cement and then save the CO2 of new production, like you could with a metal, for example. It's recyclable in the sense that you can avoid extraction of new aggregates. But of all the circular economy principles that are important for cement, recycling isn't the one that is going to help us a lot with our CO2 question. And we need to keep our, our terminology quite, you know, keep, keep it right here if we're going to get, get to the right answers. Um, Finally, then, on the adaptation point, I, I, I mean, I think I see this in, in some, some, some member states already are looking at thermal performance, for, for example, and, and adjusting their profiles. And, and like a lot of other moving pieces of, uh, of, um, of, our, of our overall transition here, um, yeah, we, it's something we also need to look at. Um, how important it is will vary across Europe, um, and, and uh, what we know about exactly what will happen in the future is limited, but again, it's an issue to this that we do that. Thank you very much. Kistus, did you want to come in on this point about, you know, as, uh, with the renovation wave, are we taking enough account of the impact of climate change? Um, I hope so. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the best, uh, of course, to answer that question from, uh, from our colleagues in DG Klima would have been Arthur, who himself is Indeed. from Klima. Indeed. Yes, no, just came in in this battle, so. <laughs> right. But, but uh, absolutely, we have to, we really have to take into account uh, uh, that because uh, climate, uh, climate adaptation is, is part of our response. You know, we have to you know, on the one hand, we have to reduce the emissions. At the same time, we have to realize that certain things will not be the same, uh, you know, probably forever. So that's precisely what we need to do. And just, you know, one example is indeed the resilience and the durability of the buildings. You know, if we know that uh, some of the areas are for flooding or they would be for more severe uh, uh, climate uh, uh, phenomenon, you know, how do we make sure that uh, all that is, is taken into account? And that's why I've been talking about the quality and the deeper innovation. You know, if we build, we have to build really the quality things, you know, not really uh, cheap, uh, low quality uh, uh, buildings and all together, the build environments, you know, that will not last uh, for a long time. Thank you. Um, do you want to react, Laurie, on the recycling point? And yes, also, yes. Two specific questions to you, or questions about recarbonation. So you're the person to answer them. In which, the way in which concrete recarbonation throughout its whole life cycle is currently taken into account, says the questioner, is unfair, particularly in comparison to other materials for which all absorbed CO2 is considered and the end of life release is ignored. And another comment, re recarbonation methodology must be agreed and approved by the UN but happens every day in existing constructions without jeopardizing with correct design mm -hmm. durability. It's important, makes it relevant for the CO2 balance of specific countries. In fact, they were two points from the same person. So please do react on the recycling and perhaps also on those points okay. about recarbonation. 
Yes, I, I wanted to um, to comment on what Per just say about recycling not uh, helping us very much about our CO2 uh, uh, reduction map roadmaps. I fully agree. If we only take into account uh, recycle uh, aggregates or uh, fines for cements, um, it won't lower the CO2 uh, um, footprint. But if you tie it uh, with recarbonation, like I mentioned earlier, uh, huge amounts can be stored. Uh, quite easily and locally because in the previous panel we talk about CC um, uh, storage, carbon capture and storage in the North Sea and everything but not everybody has access to this uh, um, to this uh, North Sea or to these uh, sites of storage so it's 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 quite interesting to do it locally with uh, with something we are going to use again and and if i can just uh, add two more comments uh, in fact fasca we are actually looping in the loop because we are taking uh, the co2 from the cement production to recarbonize the the, the aggregates or the fine and what's very encouraging is that uh, the low carbon cements that are will that will come uh, on the market very very soon um, they they show they show um, that recarbonation potential could be even higher for those low carbon uh, cements so it's a very very positive situation we are going to decrease the quantity of co2 produce for cement production and we will store part of the CO2 into uh, recycled concrete. Thank you very much. There's another question here. I don't know whether Maria uh, or Kate Stusis, you could pick up on this. What is the role of investors? And the speaker points out, says the majority of investors in this area are state-owned companies or directly the state budget when we're talking about the built environment. So how do you see their role when we're talking about you know, the different players in all of this and what they need to do? Maria, do you have a thought there? Yes, I think that uh, it is important for, for the state players as well as the, the private invest, investors to get involved. Because I think that uh, now we have an, a, a window of opportunity in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, recovery and using the, the renovation wave in order to, to create jobs and jobs. For example, if we finally speed up, we can uh, create in a very short period of time more than uh, 360,000 jobs and uh, of course I, I would like just to, to insist on three issues concerning the investments. The first one is the, the legislative framework that we have to have. So it is important to speed up in terms of, of adapting the legislation, in terms of revising the, the, the directive concerning renovation. The second one is some funding. We have to use all the available financial instruments that we have including the IEP's uh, uh, financial instrument, the smart sector building uh, instrument and others. And we have to, to, to finally to have something that it is the, 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 the clarification of additionality. We have to, to put at the same pool the money coming from, from, from different sources. And the third one is the, the engagement of the people because everything depends on the demand. If we finally raise awareness and if we finally convince people, but it's not only to change windows or, or doors, but it's also for their own uh, everyday life. They are upgrading their quality of life and also they, they, they protecting their health and their selves. So I think that it's much more complicated than in calling the investors, but it is a window of opportunity for investments, especially when we have now the, the recovery resilient facility and the MFF at the same time. Let me ask Magali, um, in terms of this EU financing uh, that, that, that is now available under Next Generation EU, under the, 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 the normal EU budget over the next seven years, where can public money of that type best be used? Uh, because the Commission has said uh, they see, in fact, the renovation wave very much, look, this is something that can be a tool for economic recovery. So very much part of this next generation EU recovery package. But for you, where can that financing best be used to really advance? So, so I think there's several things here. Um, there are some of the things we can do to decarbonize cement and concrete that do not require financing, but requires other help, for example, when I replace my fossil fuel by waste, I need to make sure that the waste is recognized as something that is low carbon to start with. And I need to have the supply chain of that waste to come all the way to my kiln, which is not always obvious in, in all countries. 
Um, when it comes to clinker factor, again, same thing. I need to make sure that the slag I get, I can get it easily if, if it's with slag, and that in terms of CO2, it's recognized, etc. So I'm encouraged. But where and but all of these usually financially, the financial is there because uh, the investment you make in terms of filters, etc., to 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 get more waste, for example. Um, you get it back because you don't pay for the fuel anymore. So, so all of this works well. Where the big, big financial challenge, and I think it was discussed in the previous uh, panel, was really the carbon capture. Mm -hmm. The total infrastructure of carbon capture, Laurie mentioned it earlier, what do we do with the usage? So the cost of the carbon capture and the uh, infrastructure that is needed to either transport it, and we know transporting carbon is quite complicated, either find using user cases, and the problem with the user case in our case is, is a scale. I mean, a, a typical cement plant would, would emit about 1 million tons of CO2 per year. So, so scalability of it is, is a problem. It's not, I can find many user cases for, for small quantity, but not for the type of quantity. And of course the cost, the, the cost of the full thing. So this is where, for example, um, when we got uh, a partial financing from the German government for our West Coast test, which I certainly pronounced really badly, and I apologize for that project we have in Germany, which is uh, we would capture and um, that CO2 will be transformed in, uh, in um, kerosene. We need huge amount of energy. The reason why we can do it there is because we are right next to a huge uh, wind plant and uh, we can use the offload of that energy to do it. So that's, but again, if we had to pay for the energy, uh, at, at normal costs, and it would not work. Or if we had to use a carbonated energy, then it would defeat the purpose of the project. So I think, really, for me, carbon capture in, in terms of size of challenge. It's the most important, yeah. Well, it's the most important by far. Other comments to this question of where can the EU money, the public money, best be used uh, to leverage private, in, private sector investment or to fill a gap where it doesn't exist? Anybody want to come in on this point? Per, can I lure you into this discussion? <laughs> yeah, I, I, so, so look, I've, I've, I've on and off every year since about 2005, I've worked on carbon capture projects in one way or other. Uh, and it started, of course, with their power sector, as we heard, and we're no, no longer talking much about that. And then we moved on to industry. And maybe finally now we are actually moving. Um, and it, we are, I, frankly, the track record we have of finding good ways to finance and co-finance um, capital intensive uh, demonstration projects in in the EU is something we, we need to give, you know, take a hard look and, and, and really try and see if we can, this time around we can, we, can, uh, we can solve it. 10 years ago when we tried, we didn't. Um, and this time we really do have to do it. We do not have time not to succeed with that. So I would echo the, the carbon capture, uh, not just in the capture side, but in the infrastructure and finding models for storage and integrating it. And of course you can't invest and into something that gives you, a, a, you know, both a, a, an investment cost first and then a higher operating cost without knowing that there is a market there. So it's a big synchronization exercise of not just deploying the initial capital uh, to make the first steps possible, but also to create the market and to create the infrastructure we need. And, and, let's, and now, we, now is really the time to hook arms on this. We, we need it to happen now. Thank you. I just wanted to put a question to Ketstusis uh, and also to Maria that's coming from the audience, and then we'll try and wrap up and draw some conclusions. Um, interesting points, says Olympia Dollar, and interesting points and ideas, but how could regulations embrace so many objectives in such short notice in order to take action fast enough and be in line to meet the climate neutrality target for 2050? Um, and I'm, I'm thinking here, you know, very much, we, it's interesting because she's in the regulations, so the building regulations here, we had that as one of our questions at the beginning. Can we move fast enough, Ketstusis, in order to address all these issues and deliver in time? Same question to you, Maria, and then we'll wrap up. Yes. yes, well, Europe probably has not been known for moving fast, <laughs> but it was more known for moving resolutely when it decides. But indeed, here we really have very little time at least for the climate um, uh, and, and other environmental um, objectives and, and imperatives. So I, I would say that uh, that's precisely what the Green Deal is meant to do, is to outline everything that needs to be done in the next couple of years and to put in place the new mechanisms that would bring about the systemic change. So indeed, we'll have to do it rather fast. And doing fast is not, uh, is not uh, easy, as we know, because uh, our own decision-making is, is pretty slow. You know, it's, 
you know, we have to go through, for instance, the better regulation principles, meaning doing impact assessments, gathering all the evidence, then we have very tedious and lengthy co-decision process. Then we have to give the time member states to transpose uh, the, at least when it comes to uh, legislation, then businesses need extra time to adapt, usually transitional period. So it really takes us, you know, four or five years. So, so here we don't have that much of a luxury of the time. So we'll have to definitely move faster. And that's why uh, the streamlining of, this, of the process of policy making is, 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 is here. Also, we're trying to put, let's say, to foot the bill with, a, with the next generation uh, um, uh, budget and the, the multi-annual financial framework budget as well to make sure that, uh, that the money is there, the investment is there, and that partly responds to the question uh, from before is, you know, the role of investors. That is really to leverage, but also to de-risk and also to fill the gaps which uh, private investment so far does not, does not, does not uh, fill in but also to make sure that longer term thinking is embedded into uh, corporate thinking as well. And th that means not only uh, for, for, let's say, cement kilns or cement factories or concrete factories or construction companies, anything, but also for huge investors, for big investors, for institutional, for private investors, for risk capital. Because, you know, it, we, we, we know the story that, that everybody wants to get the profits in the next two, three, five years max, right? But how do we make sure that, uh, that these investors really see the benefits down the road in 10, 15, 20 years? And that's precisely the gap we're trying to fill. And I think with the taxonomy, with different corporate rules, with reporting, uh, we get a different equation in, in different calculus in, in business corporate accounting. Yeah? And all of a sudden, people start to see the benefits uh, investing into something that may have not been reaping the fast profits here. So I'm really optimistic that the change is really coming faster than we- Maria, are you optimistic? You said, when I said at the beginning, what's the key challenge? You said implementation. Mangali complained her first comment was, it's too slow. Can you speed it up? Are you optimistic like Kestris? It's a brief one, if you would. Well, very, very briefly, the key words, I think it is synchronization. We cannot discuss about how can we increase the production of hydrogen and at the same time, we are reluctant on issues concerning CCU and CCS. We have to decide that we have to go forward. The second issue is how can we fast move in order to, to address the need of our people. And in this regard, it is important to have a monitoring, uh, a monitoring process in terms of, uh, of, uh, in, of addressing uh, of, uh, the member states' uh, targets concerning the energy and climate uh, and the climate uh, plans. And I think that the, the renovation wave must be included in energy and climate plan. And we have to, to, to have a very close monitor on this. I'm not so optimist. I cannot think that uh, if we finally streamline the legislation, member states will say, wow, here it is, and we, they will <laughs> go forward. But I think that now we can create a very, very interesting window of opportunity for the investors and for the governments as well, because it is time to provide jobs, growth, profits. Thank you very much. Uh, we are almost at the end of this session and I just want to ask each of you, as I did with our first panel, uh, to identify out of all we've talked about, and I'll go in reverse order to my first question. So Magali, for you, if you had to identify, and I accept there's people have talked about a holistic approach, there's many, many issues we need to address. But if we are to maximize your industry's contribution to the sustainable built environment of the future, what for you, a priority for yourself as an industry and one for the policymakers? Same question to you all in one minute each, if you would. Magali. Um, so priority for our sector is definitely that um, um, to all move together and move fast. And that's why being in part of SEM Bureau and all going with the, with the roadmap that SEM Bureau has issued is absolutely key. Priority for for the public is the public sector has to incentivize with all the rules that we talked about to make sure that uh, green cement and green concrete are the things that we need to put in any infrastructural type of uh, work that is being put out there. Thank you very much. Per? I think I would emphasize the need to create a market. Um, where we have succeeded in this transformation to date, where there is renewable energy, where we are about to succeed, uh, in electric vehicles um, or what have you, um, it is where there is a sufficient market. And, and, and it's subtle. 
it is not just about creating a market of X million, X billion. It's about creating a change in expectations so that everybody knows which the direction of travel now is as we're starting to invest a lot of money. Thank you very much. Laurie? To the construction uh, value chain, uh, I would say go for life thinking and, and maximize CO2 saving at every step of the value chain, including the, the very end. And uh, to policymaker, like I said, please recognize recarbonation as a key way to absorb CO2. And uh, like Magali said, incentivize uh, uh, particularly the permanent storage of CO2 into concrete. Thank you. Maria? Well, the key is performance, once again. And in this regard, I think that we have to create a trend, politically speaking. And of course, for the, for this, for the sector, I think that uh, they have to work more closely with the politicians in order to increase circularity and at the same time, in order to, to support research and innovation. And something very much emphasized also in Sembiro's roadmap, that collaboration, all the, the, the value chain working together and working with the policy makers and the policy shapers. Gestutis, you have the last word, your key priority for yourself as a, I was corrected by Artur earlier, as a policy shaper, I will call you not a policy maker, uh, and your priority for industry. Um, I would say um, the, the key words here is systemic, holistic, life cycle, and partnerships. I think these are absolutely the key words that should underpin further actions and further policies, whether it's for the businesses or for public authorities. And on that harmonized note, uh, I can't ask the audience to join me in thanking you, so I will do it on their behalf. Thank you for a great discussion. Thank you again for all your questions and all your comments. I'm sorry I couldn't squeeze all of them in. We managed to tackle quite a few, uh, but with so many of you attending, and it's been great to have you with us, not all of them. Before we close, I am delighted uh, to hand over to SEM Bureau Chief Executive Kuhn Koppenholler to make some closing remarks. Thank you, panel, very much indeed. Kern, some closing thoughts from you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jackie, and thank you to everybody for a very interesting debate uh, this morning. Um, I will close with um, three sets of comments very briefly, uh, Jackie. First of all, we heard some political messages very clearly. Then I want to say a word about the messages from, but also for industry. And I would like to come back on a point in terms of the image for the industry and how we can improve it, because that was a point that John um, basically emphasized as well. Um, from political m messages, what I wrote down here is that indeed the green Green Deal is on the rails and firmly on the rails, uh, even despite the COVID-19 crisis. I think for our sector, we've also seen company announcements in the past weeks, very ambitious company announcements. So as a sector, we are there. And I also heard now also from Magali that there are changes in market uptake, which is still challenging, but there are changes happening. Second takeaway um, is that carbon capture and storage is indeed essential for our industry, but it's not the silver bullet. I mean, it's not the only technology. We need need to work on CO2 avoidance because that's also an important issue. Reducing our emissions along the value chain, reducing our emissions in manufacturing is essential and that will then lead to an easier public acceptance also of carbon capture for the remaining emissions, process emissions more specifically. Third political message we got is that the renovation wave is from a political perspective essential for the European citizen, is essential for the European economy. Um, I think that is really crucial but I would like to add to that that renovation wave is also about infrastructure. It's also about civil engineering. Um, our product, concrete, is essential for renovation, but it's not only about buildings. It's also about infrastructure and civil engineering more generally. And then the fourth point I got also from uh, Maria right now in this panel is that we need to look at innovation and financing innovation. Horizon Europe uh, needs to be funded. Um, and I think we have an ally in the European Parliament to say to the Council that, yes, we need to have funding for that and more funding than what was agreed in the European Council. These are the messages politically that I got. Then and the messages from industry and for industry, industry needs legal certainty and predictability. Um, the carbon border mechanism needs to be there alongside phase four of EU ETS. We heard from the uh, trade union indeed 
just transition mechanism. I mean, that's really essential that we take the workers with us. Um, and that is essential coming to the third point on that industry message. We have 200 plants spread across Europe. This is different from some other industries that can easily fit into the industrial strategies and the industrial hubs. For us, that will be more challenging. Uh, and I think we need to look at the social side of that, at the worker side of that. How do we take everybody with us? How do we do with these plans? How do we make sure that all the concepts of circular economy and decarbonization are also valid um, for the plans that are more spread um, across Europe? And what I also heard is that we need that joined up policy framework where in fact there is a coordination between the different policies, coordination between the different DGs and the European Commission. And that brings me to the last point where I would like to say, do we have an image issue? Maybe we do, but at the same time, I think I'm very optimistic and there I share also Magali's optimism. Um, we're looking at the full value chain now and that's the advantage of the Green Deal. The Green Deal goes beyond the pure manufacturing, looks at the value chain, looks at the life cycle. And I've heard life cycle very often being mentioned here this morning and this is essential life cycle because it allows us to also make sure that recarbonation is taken up into the policy framework and that was addressed in the second panel and secondly it also means that collaboration throughout the value chain is key to achieving our objectives uh, collaboration with architects collaboration with contractors and in fact by reaching out to these people we reach out to the end consumer and we reach out to the citizen and we reach out to improving our image and improving the place of concrete as an essential building material for a uh, society of tomorrow. So these would be my concluding remarks, Jackie, but um, before handing over to you, I would like to thank um, for my side, um, all the panelists. Um, I would also like to thank um, in my team, uh, Joseph, um, our communications manager, who really made this happen, uh, Emmanuel uh, in the public affairs team, and my team, but also my members um, or the members of SEMBIRO, because I think what this debate and these debates have shown is that not only we can defend our arguments, but we can defend them with facts, data, studies. And I think that's essential for a sector, for an association to be credible, is that we bring forward uh, data and facts. Uh, it's that with that that your arguments uh, stand or fall. Um, and I think we've done a very good job throughout the industry of substantiating our arguments with very strong data and facts and studies. So I'm very proud of that. And lastly, uh, Jackie, I really thank you for a fantastic moderation of this debate and I hand it over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kuhn, and thank you to you and to SEM Bureau for hosting us today and such an interesting discussion. Panel, you were wonderful. Uh, the first panel were wonderful too. State Secretary is no longer with us, but I would like to thank him in absentia. Raul, a great thank you to you. Uh, but most of all, thank you to all of you, SEM Bureau members uh, and other audience uh, for joining us today and taking part in this discussion. And it only remains for me to wish you a very enjoyable rest of the day and Stay safe. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. Thank you.